Hello Avatar fans and welcome to the next episode of the Avatar Online podcast. This is going to be episode 271 of the podcast. We'll be continuing our Netflix Avatar coverage here but also covering uh, some news uh, given that it's been a while since the last podcast. Uh, of course this is the official podcast for the fan site Avatar The Last Airbender Online.com and I'm going to be your main host Morgan Airspeed Prime. Joining me on the podcast is Greg, Greg2B from the site. What's up, everyone? Excellent. So on today's show, we're going to be reviewing uh, episode three of Netflix Avatar, which is called Omashu. Uh, but also we're going to start off with a pretty big news segment here because a lot of stuff has happened um, in the last couple of weeks. So um, let's start out with um, the information on the new Avatar mobile game. So this is a Avatar Legends Realms Collide. So even the name is completely new. Like this went from, I got a press release about this, I think in like August last year, that was basically just an image and hey, we're doing a game about Avatar. Now all of a sudden they're starting to reveal little bits of information. At this point, all we mainly have is a description, a bunch of screenshots and a small trailer showing a little bit of the intro cinematic revealing the uh kind of main villain character uh chan yu um uh, i think there's a lot of confusion going around the place in terms of like a lot of people i don't think really get a sense for what this game is um and while they're actively communicating with people there's a lot of we'll reveal more stuff in the future and we all kind of just want the information right now. So the unfortunate thing here is that there's no real release date information in terms of like, when is it coming out? In the initial press release, they said it was 2024, but um, we don't really know what the situation is. If there's a beta coming up, like, there probably is, um, but there's no information on when exactly that's happening. Um, there's interest in it, certainly, um, but uh, beyond that, I think most people are in a case of, uh, I need to see a little bit more. But um, what are your thoughts on this? Avatar Legends, Realms Collide, the new mobile game. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, you know, it sounds like it could be intriguing. I think the, the trailer definitely looks neat for, you know, what is it, like 20 seconds or whatever it is. So it it feels like it's, it's something more than it really is because, you know, it has that sort of, you know, behind it. And like you said, they are really, at least it feels like, well, at least social media wise, they are pretty like actively sort of like engaging, um, which even, you know, the previous mobile game, we had had a lot of that as well. I think, it, you know, especially when they were sort of doing some, uh, the live events and stuff like that. So I don't know. I think it's cool that they are, you know, doing this. I do hope that it becomes something interesting because I definitely understand the sort of like, you know, wait and see sort of frustration idea that many other people have because it there isn't really a lot to go on it right now. And like you can go to the, the Play Store page and you can like, you know, register for the beta or whatever, but we don't really know when that's going to be a thing. And, you know, there's, there's screenshots, like you said, but there's not too much in the ways of like what's the real sort of like mechanics other than we know it's like a strategy type game. But I mean... The previous one was also a strategy type game so that can mean a lot of different things mm. yeah that, that's probably the big thing is like there's characters like it's a cross-generational type thing i guess that's what realms collide means but we don't really know if it's canon and they're really cagey around that they're not answering questions about like if the game's story is actually canonical or not because of course in the screenshots it's like here's roku standing next to mako and here's like um, 12 year old <laughs> Ang standing next to um, um, like Tenzin basically and so it's like wait what era is this set in and all this sort of stuff and um, apparently the game story the the background um, dynamic has been written by a writer from ATLA they confirmed that which I thought was actually one of the more significant reveals and they barely posted about that um, but that doesn't really tell us if it's canon or not and um, so is the mixed character element of it just for gameplay or you know is there actually a story going on here because it's kind of interesting because at least to me and it's unfortunate because like there there is kind of people have the what is it like the epk or something like that for the game which has some basic information in it which actually says more than is publicly out there but i think from the trailer you can tell like who the dark spirit that the um <laughs> barbarian death cult worships is because they're very clear with the colors and if you've seen the official art for the character like um you kind of know it's, it's father glowworm um pretty much so um that's cool 
and that's definitely interesting it's just like could you publicize that like sooner rather than later because that's like a, a selling point in a way for people because Glowworm didn't quite get to be used in Generations, but him being used here is kind of a cool um, idea. Um, but yeah, that seems to be the idea. This leader character, Chan Yu, is um, uh, based on some of the social media stuff. Uh, his spirit is connected to the spirit of Father Glowworm is the setup here. So there's some sort of like spirit uh, empowerment uh, element going on here. So um, that's we're getting into sort of, you know, avatar level or just the really powerful level of characters here so hundun uh, you know spirit enhanced characters are always quite notable so that makes it for like a, a threatening villain who's going to be a match for an avatar um i just hope they deliver on that but um what are your thoughts on the kind of uh, plot stuff that we have so far barbarian death cult and connection to a spirit yeah i mean it definitely you know definitely piques your interest with the sort of you know I guess high level what they're sort of trying to sort of bring across to people but it it does you know there is very little out there and i don't know i i wonder about you know the canon stuff and stuff because i know that was you know on the previous mobile game we had that was like a pretty cool element that that was really part of it and we could like see how it could like fill in the gaps of the different story beats and stuff that we knew and you know where we hoped it continued but unfortunately it didn't keep going um no, I think that definitely has some possibilities to definitely, you know, make people more interested in this game. But I don't know. For some reason, this doesn't feel like it has as much of that behind it, even if it does have one of the writers on it. I don't know. That's just sort of the, the sense of feeling that I get from at least from, you know, what we can tell from how the game actually works. And, you know, I'm sure there's more out there if you really try to dig into it and find out. But I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised on this one if it wasn't as sort of canon and sync as the other one um mm. which i think don't think is necessarily a bad thing i think you know of course we're all into that and that's sort of you know how we think of avatar in general just because it's so narrative driven in general um but you no know, it could just be sort of a side piece game mm. yeah um at the very least like the hope here is that because it is multi-generational they they should be able to do what the um generations did which was like a kind of like debut character designs and stuff like that like if they get into the novels like we didn't get too far in the kyoshi stuff so a lot of people are kind of asking for like hey lauga and all these other sort of characters from the novels like can you do them here and it seems like that's a possibility where we at least get i suppose like official sort of like canon depictions even if like story stuff canon but there's lots of questions about like Okay, that's your main story, but can you tell, like, side story stuff um, in, like, a different era? Like, could you do an adaptation of a novel here in this game if required, or are we locked into whatever way it works? Um, but uh, the basic idea of this seems to be that when you, when you create your character, you choose one of the elements, and this is effectively the architecture design for your base, depending on what element you choose. Uh, this also seems to lock you into who your kind of uh, leader character that you get first off is. So it's Katara for um, Water Tribe, Toph for Earth, uh, Zuko for Fire, and it's Tenzin for Air. So you can see straight away the difference there of like ATLA, 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 Korra. Because of the way the avatars are done in this game, they can't have Aang be the Air representative, so it has to be Tenzin. Um, which is kind of interesting as like the debut characters and then you can see in the hall of avatar kind of stuff from the screenshots at the very least we have ang Korra, and kiyoshi but roku is also in one of the screenshots um so you know th there's a lot of characters here um uh, and it'll be interesting to see kind of where it goes uh, other than yeah like it's some sort of base building you create an army resources um, it's very hard to get a sense for what the gameplay really is. You obviously choose like three or four characters to act as your leader characters. They are the ones who sort of command your army because there's a few shots of like your leader characters commanding armies going up against the, the death cult. Uh, but I have no idea what if you're clicking attacks here or if this is literally just levels determine numbers and your numbers determine if you win or not um, well, what's your sense potentially for how this is actually going to work yeah no it is interesting when you see that sort of you know i guess that that main screenshot where you actually see sort of your forces at battle and 
I don't know. I wonder if this is more of an sort of like a an idle fighter type of game rather than it being more active. But it, it definitely looks like there's other places where you have like, you know, upgradable abilities and skills, which doesn't necessarily mean it's not idle, but at least there's a little bit more sort of depth to it than just sort of, you know, completely on sort of auto run, which even the other one, you could turn it on auto if you wanted to, or you could have it more manually. So at least hope that they give you that sort of option here. Um, but yeah, it is interesting to see that it is more, more base driven, which I think is, you know, sort of, you know, the, the idea of like, a, you know, like crafting and stuff is kind of popular right now. So it seems like they might be going more that sort of route with this game rather than, you know, what they had in the other mobile game. Mm hmm. Um, so yeah, the, there's not too much information out there just yet. They said there was going to be information this week, but they're very much running out of time. And that like they posted a post up like last night, but it was just one of the Google Play screenshots, and they didn't even post the corrected one with the, the spelling error change, uh, which was a bit weird. Um, so I'm not sure if they're just going with the idea of hey, we posted something on social media. It's news, even though it's it's not really news. And um, because as far as I'm aware, like there's clearly more to the trailer than what they kind of showed here. Because I'm pretty sure the Chanyu trailer is just a cut up version of like the intro cinematic. And then we know you can see from the screenshots to get the names for some of the other characters like uh, Fuzhi and then. In one of the other ones on social media, Borte uh, is, is, I think, one of the other um, uh, Barbarian Death Cult members. So there's some stuff like that that I guess is going to have to come out. But I think they need to get more information on this uh, sooner rather than later. Um, next up here, we have... Um, uh, so we will go into some of the comic stuff here. So uh, Bounty Hunter and the Tea Brewer preview pages. So... Um, out of nowhere, again, because it's su super early, because this book is not out until the 6th of August, because it's on the tail end of a bunch of delays. Um, we have six preview pages for this book. Um, technically, we have more, because at New York Comic Con, we got some um, preview pages. So we actually have quite a bit now from this book. But this one is in particularly interesting, this batch of pages, because it gives us a, big, a bigger insight into what the June and her parents' uh, backstory is going to be. And probably the most hype part of this is definitely what the specific aspect of Iroh's backstory is going to be in this book. So um, in the pages that we get here, we actually get one of the pages showing uh, June's mother and father and finding out that like her mother was a, a thief uh, and I guess her father was some sort of a, a bandit and <laughs> there's an implication of potentially how they met, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, but then like there, there's a bit of a cut between when the next page happens and she talks about the principles of herself and, and her father that they never worked for the government, uh, basically allegiance to no one. Uh, but the big thing, like I said, is the Iroh backstory, which seems to be the implication in the story is that June is doing this bounty to grab Iroh for one of his previous soldiers under his command during the siege of Bossing Se, because this soldier has always wanted to, I guess, confront Iroh over why did you abandon the siege? And we're getting this kind of different perspective on it here of like Iroh didn't uh, order a safe retreat after it all happened. He just left. And so people were trapped behind enemy lines. And this character here, who we don't know the name of, this soldier, we see a shot of him trying to escape earthbenders in the city. We see the, the broken wall. And um, so this is the element of Iroh's past that's going to be addressed here. Uh, the big thing from this is just I, I think the book has gone up in basically everyone's interest now that the preview pages have come out. Um, it's just unfortunate that it's still quite a bit away in August. But um, what are your thoughts on Bounty Hunter and the Tea Brewer now that we know quite a bit more about it? Yeah, no, I definitely can see why the, the interest level would be up. I mean, this is, you know, what we always were sort of wondering because, you know, we thought it was like an, an odd couple to begin with other than, you know, we know they've interacted a little bit in the show, but nothing on any sort of significant level. So to see, you know, how they're actually playing off of each other in these couple pages from, you know, Iroh's capture to them sort of like surviving, being sort of attacked on the way and sort of getting both a little bit of backstory from both of them, I think definitely makes it a lot more intriguing to see where they're actually going with this and even though we know you know it's only one book there's only so much they can do with this right so like it's not like we're gonna get iroh or even june's like full story although i suspect we'll probably get more of her um 
just because of her character being a bit more minor, not having as much to do with her. But, you know, I think it's, it definitely makes it a lot more worth it. But yeah, it, it is still quite a long way away. I mean, I wonder if this was just sort of like the the original timing that they wanted things to come out before they had all the delays and stuff. So it just sort of was on sort of like auto put it out there or whatever, or, you know, however, but definitely makes it a lot more worth our while, I think. Yeah, it's just the unfortunate thing of, like, August, like, it's getting to the point where it's nearly a year between books. Like, uh, Azula in the Spirit Temple was the last comic that came out, and um, it's August here. The Mako comic uh, still hasn't been solicited yet, um, so that's um, that's going to have to happen soon, or it's not going to make it into the year. And what should have been a pretty big year for Dark Horse is quickly turning into, if, if there's nothing else apart from this like this has to be their worst ever year for comics like one book um in the year before avatar studios kind of gets going it's like what's happened to publishing here kind of crazy that it's kind of fallen apart a little bit like this um but we'll see what happens there's there's still early in the year there's room for books to be announced because there's going to have to be a follow-up book to the bounty hunter and the tea brewer there's another um one shot coming it's not going to be a direct like sequel to the Iro June comic, but it's about other characters. Um, and then there's other core comics that still have to come out. So uh, interesting stuff there. Uh, then we'll move into the other publishing bit, bit of news. And that is, um, it's not a comic, but it's a picture book. So Avatar The Last Airbender, My Cabbages. We'd heard about this for a while, but finally we got the um, cover for this book, as well as uh, four preview pages here. Um, so yes, it's a 40 page picture book. It's going to be all about the cabbage merchant, but it's not just a recap book. It says in the description for this that there is going to be new content featuring the cabbage merchant because there's no way to fill in 40 pages with the couple of appearances that he has. So that's <laughs> intriguing. But then the probably the most interesting part of it so far has been uh, these preview pages reveal his name uh, straight away. First line is a uh, merchant. Uh, say i i think people said that it's something like that um because it means like vegetable in chinese or something like that uh, but it's c-a-i because I, I, I was initially like is that kai but like that's k-a-i and uh we, we have sai we're going to talk about later on and um, s-a-i so um interesting stuff nearly 20 years we finally get the cabbage merchant's name but uh what are your thoughts on this uh cabbage merchant book new content yeah i mean you know this, this is a picture book so there's only so much they can do with it but the fact that we get his his name i think you know that's you know at least something out of it and you know i'm sure it'll be a f great fun book for for kids to read so neat yeah, and that is also out in August. So all the publishing stuff is pretty much happening second half of the year. Roku novel just before this. Still waiting for the cover on the Roku novel. We were kind of maybe hoping it was this week, but it was actually the My Cabbages <laughs> cover. Maybe next week. Otherwise, like they're getting to the point where like it's like three months or something like that to release. Like you want to have the cover as soon as possible. So hopefully soon. Um, next up, also about comics. Uh, this is um. Avatar Webtoon. Basically, this translates to they have put up the Dark Horse Avatar The Last Airbender comics on Webtoon in that format. It's not all of them so far. So far, it is just basically part of the Promise Part 1 still. Um, and these are going up weekly as a new way to read the comics. There's no new content here, though they have been readjusted to the webtoon style of reading which is always like scroll down basically so every panel reads downwards rather than like across and then down um so interesting uh it's a it's an official free way to read the comics um but it's obviously going to be a very slow way to do it if you plan to just like start them here and stick to this format knowing that there's like 18 plus books out there just factoring in like the trilogies and stuff like that let alone all the extra stuff um it's going to be years before all that stuff goes up at this <laughs> pace um not to mention some of it, it you do have to kind of pay for it but the new chapter just went up today it seems like the way it's going to work is that there's one new free chapter every week and then one new extra general chapter goes up so it seems like there's always going to be this kind of buffer of like seven chapters you can pay to access um so 
we'll see if they ever add uh, more in quicker but it's it's interesting i've seen some people excited about this but um most people are like oh it's not new okay Okay, um, interesting. But uh, what are your thoughts on this kind of coming out of kind of nowhere? Yeah, it does feel like it's out of nowhere. I mean, you know, it's cool. It's another exposure point. You know, we're always talking about, you know, getting more people into it. And this is just another another place you can direct them at that's free and legal and everything like that. So it's, it's cool that it's out there. Um, it's definitely not something I would have you know particularly thought would be there but you no know, it seems like they've done a good job of you know reformatting it and you no know, there's there's tons of content so it's not like it's going to run out of anything you know anytime soon like you said like if they go at the pace they're going at you no know, it will be quite a while and i'm sure it'll definitely bring you no know, more people into webtoons and their platform it was sort of like you know right on their front page and everything big and bold so you know it's definitely their you know, in terms of attracting viewers and stuff like that. So it's going to work that way for sure. Um, but yeah, for, you know, any of us who have already been in the fandom, it's, it's not particularly anything interesting. I mean, you no, know, yeah, they could do other stuff in the future with this format if they so choose to, but it doesn't feel like that's necessarily where they're going with this. This is just another way to get it out there and to have people check it out. And I'm sure we'll bring a lot of new people into it as well, so it'll it'll work for what they want to just for the rest of us it's not anything particularly special uh yeah like it's it's been in the top two from what i can see like the entire time since it's launched um mm-hmm. the numbers are huge on it like what's this like views 1.9 million uh what's this like likes or i guess subscriptions to it like over half a million uh 9.86 out of 10 rating so people are liking it uh which is very very good um it's just that like i would hope that, that uh, quite a few people reading it this way realize that they could just like go out and get like a lot of it much quicker and um, you can get the omnibus editions especially for good prices digital digital stuff is often pretty cheap as well and um, so there's that and yeah a lot of suggestions of like mm, what if we did get a, a new original avatar webtoon but the thing that to me goes against that is that i don't view dark horse as being kind of almost like agile enough to make something like that happen <laughs> that like there's so much restrictions um just with it being a, a franchise kind of ip and then with how slow it seems like they are to just make stuff happen i can't imagine no matter what creative team they got that they'd be able to consistently put out weekly chapters even monthly chapters i'd be very hesitant about um if they can't get like one or two books that they release a year and keep them in any way on time uh i can only imagine what they'd be trying to do with a weekly or monthly style book um if they could make it happen it would be really cool because i feel like we kind of need something like that just a little bit of content every week but um I, i can't see it at the moment for sure um but it would be cool if it led to something like that like the description on webtoons does say legend of korra it is under the Avatar The Last Airbender kind of thing. Um, I suppose it, it mainly mentions it in terms of franchise. It doesn't specifically mention the Korra comics, but I suppose Korra comics would go up as their separate thing. You know, it, it's something, it's interesting, um, and it's just a sense of, like, a lot of Avatar stuff is kind of happening, as we'll get through in these kind of upcoming topics. It's it, Everything's beginning to sort of uh, come together here. Um, we'll talk about Avatar Fortnite, but I actually forgot this. Um avatar roblox is also happening in like july i think um i i personally know very little about roblox just that it's a quite popular game especially with kids and they're doing a big official avatar update which obviously is kind of interesting and cool they obviously have avatar minecraft we're going to talk about avatar fortnite avatar roblox they're they're doing all the big collaborations they just kind of need a big actual game of their of their own but do you have any thoughts on the uh, avatar roblox um collaboration that's happening um no not really i remember seeing something about it and seeing some elements that they were going to put into it um but i just know roblox is so huge and there's so many different things you can do within roblox itself which just makes it you know massive on the level of you know fortnite and everything like that so Mm -hmm. It's cool. Yeah, and then, yeah, Avatar Fortnite is basically going to be starting uh, next week. Uh, April 2nd is when Korra will be available to unlock as a skin in the game. 
uh, in addition to a bunch of other avatar items. Now, you do need to get the battle pass for the current season of Fortnite, but it's a very exciting kind of thing that Korra is the first one coming to the game because it's a it's a pretty significant position because it's the main like um, franchise included in the battle pass like this was a uh, in the last season it was like this was solid snake metal gear solid this is the position that Korra's is in uh, but there's more than just Korra. uh the week afterwards i think uh, april 9th ang is coming into the game uh with an, a kind of special avatar event pass so this is how you'll get the uh, ang skin and again bunch of other items including like an appa glider and then we're also expecting there to be other characters in the shop as well so I'm assuming there'll be Katara and Zuko. Uh, how much more beyond that, we're not really sure. But there's a whole thing happening here. The skins, but then there'll be an like Ang in the iceberg kind of island on the map as like a point of interest that will slowly kind of come in and attach itself to the island. So you'll be able to do quests, uh, talking to Ang, I guess. Uh, they'll be adding in bending as like a mythic weapon basically uh, that you can get in the game um, and like other stuff like that. So it's it's a big event here where uh, last season this was a combination of like Metal Gear Solid and then the main event was like TMNT. But Avatar is getting both of those kind of uh, bits uh, this time out. So um, a lot of people are excited for this one. I am because uh, I quite like Fortnite. But uh, what are your thoughts on this? Avatar coming to the big game. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely feels like they're putting a lot of you know effort and funding behind this, which I think is is pretty cool to see that it's getting this much sort of you know activity around it for you know one of the most popular games ever, right? So you know, and this is a continually live updated game, so they can continue with this for on and on or as much as they you know see fit to actually do it. So no, I think you know the fact that it's getting this much sort of, you know, notice is pretty cool. I hope it, you know, turns into other things as well. Um, but no, it definitely seems pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, the, the Korra model, which we can see in game currently, is actually really nice. It's her kind of book one slash three mm -hmm. outfit. But then at the end of it, you unlock um, book four kind of return of Rava kind of avatar state look, um, where it's Korra in blue uh, with the Rava kind of symbol coming through. Um very very cool though it seems like it's not like changeable to just become her normal book four outfit though might find out differently when it actually properly unlocks but um i think we probably would have heard otherwise so that's a, that's a bit of a weird choice that like her book four outfit is like right there if you just turn the lights off basically um <laughs> uh so that'll, that'll be an interesting one to see what, what they do there but still it's, it's a very cool um skin that i even non-Avatar fans are kind of excited for it just because it looks cool. Um, which was also a kind of fun thing to see because, of course, uh, a lot of the Fortnite people leaking some of this stuff are, like, completely disconnected from Avatar. So they're like, what is this stuff? Um, you know, they're all talking about Fortnite lore. And I'm kind of like, wait, Fortnite has lore? I know it kind of does, but it's, like, people are like, who's this ice character? Um, and so, you know, it's Aang. It's Aang. Um... But uh, yeah, that's uh, Avatar Fortnite starting uh, in just a few days, actually. Um, then we go over to board game information. So this is Avatar Journey of Aang. Now, we had heard about this years ago. Uh, it was meant to launch, I think, on Kickstarter probably last year, but there were delays. Finally, it seems to be happening here. So Avatar Journey of Aang is going to be uh, kind of crowdfunded on GameFound. So this is a, a Avatar official board game, and it's going to have a big map of the Avatar world. Uh, they call it a, what's this again? It's called a cooperative tableau dice building adventure. There's a lot of different types of cards, of course, lots of different types of dice here. Uh, you're doing the kind of journey across the three seasons to eventually defeat uh, either Fire Lord Ozai or Phoenix King Ozai, depending on the timing of the game. Uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, the the company here, Bad Crow Games, did reach out to me, so I'll, I'll be getting a copy of this to kind of uh, do some content on at some point uh, in the coming months, um, prior to, I guess, all this stuff properly happening. The, the details with the campaign are that the page is up with details, and they'll be revealing more information as it goes on, but the actual, like, crowdfunding, like, getting money, 
is not going to start until the summer because they want to get like quite a bit of feedback on a lot of this now that they're finally um actually like announcing stuff here so um still somewhat early stages here but uh we're getting there and it's nice to see the game actually happening after kind of going missing a little bit for a while there but uh any thoughts on this board game the journey of Aang? yeah no i it sounds pretty cool actually i mean i don't i don't quite know how everything works and i'm sure that's something that they're continually working on but based off of like the the preview images that they have so far it seems pretty interesting and pretty involved compared to some of the other ones we've gotten so i'm curious to see how it turns out Mm -hmm. so that's that um then um i guess we need to talk about avatar in concert because you actually attended one of the uh, performances of avatar in concert so uh, i suppose just uh, tell us how it was you know it was pretty cool overall i think i mean i went to the one in new york city so it was in brooklyn in the the king's theater um so but yeah no it was pretty interesting i mean you know of course it was pretty pretty packed um it was unfortunately it was a pretty rainy day that day but even still there was a ton of people there um i don't think it you know there weren't many seats that were empty in the the whole sort of theater that i went to um but no i think it was pretty good i mean it, their their layout of how they have it sort of set up was pretty interesting how they went through sort of the different sort of seasons as well as focusing on you know various characters and sort of their basically their highlight points right like their their highlight reels of what they did hitting the most sort of like emotional beasts of the story and then of course having the the live orchestra there to actually you know timed with everything you know perfectly in sync i think it was definitely sort of a a cool experience to actually see how that all sort of played out and you know sort of what they chose to include what they chose to admit you know their sort of order of how they did things i thought was interesting considering like if you watch the show a bunch of course you can pretty much picture you know the the sequence of the the three books and how everything goes out so that was interesting to sort of compare and contrast and then just you know the overall just sort of you know environment of it how you know everyone of course is really into it and the reactions to you know when certain titles come up on the screen and you know what people instantly sort of recognize what happened and other ones where people didn't know what was going to happen so it's interesting to see how that goes back and forth and then just the the general vibe of things and you know of course they had a ton of merch was which was interesting to see what they had up for sale um which was a, a good amount um at least compared to sort of like i know you had some images on some of the early ones from um, the other countries that had them and they had a at least they felt like they had a lot more here than mm. what I've saw, you know, from some of the other images you showed. So, of course, it was like a huge line. It was like, you know, I don't know, like eight rows of people back or whatever. So I did not, I did not choose to wait on the line for any of the merch. I thought about it and maybe even going during like intermission, but it was, it was just too much. Even in the beginning, it was too much, and then in the middle, and then at the end, the same way. So it was, that was a uh, a lot there. But no, they they had a ton of stuff there. All the sort of you know stuff for the show there as well as just other you know books and cookbooks and just general you know comic stuff and other stuff like that so they definitely had a lot of stuff there um figures as well they had too so yeah there was a a lot there in terms of the merch if you were so inclined to actually sort of go for it um but yeah no i think it was definitely a pretty cool experience i definitely would recommend it if you're into it and they have uh more of them coming up which they said they were going to have more so mm. hopefully more people will be able to sort of experience it yes the uh was a hundred city world tour or i forget what exact number was used but i think it was a hundred um they're meant to be announced uh i guess in the coming months i think they said spring at some point so i guess within the next few weeks few months we'll hear about the the first of the next stage of things because i think about of the the first wave of stuff they're kind of running out if i remember correctly where like they have the australian showing i think they're back to europe for a little bit um uh but yeah they're they're gonna have to announce stuff soon so yeah sold out sold out sold out yeah they have uh yeah germany in end of april uh netherlands netherlands also end of april back to germany again and then yeah australia june 15th and i guess everything else is going to have to be announced after june 15th uh, with all the other cities and stuff like that but yeah cool that they seem to have uh more merch over there because uh yeah at least in the first one which i mainly saw some reports on was just the the mug 
t-shirt and poster with literally the uh, concert kind of uh, piece of art on it. So uh, cool that they had other merch there. Um, probably stuff they can do maybe more easily in the US um, showings, just because I guess that's where Avatar kind of stuff is based and where most of the merchandise is sold. And it's probably a little bit more yeah. awkward for the European places, but um, still pretty cool. And um, did you get to see the Avatar Studios logo? <laughs> yeah, I definitely did get to see the avatar studios logo and their little like i guess uh intermission of sliding through the different images and stuff like that so yeah that that was there we didn't have any sort of cool announcements or anything like that during my showing here i guess they did that all for like the the first one so mm-hmm. unfortunately none of that here at least not on the the east coast maybe the west coast had some of that mm-hmm. um but yeah no that was that was pretty much it there wasn't anything extra sort of special that i could tell about this one the the orchestra was really good um they did a great job with that i think depending on where you were seating it might have been better or worse since i was definitely in sort of the the backish area of mine but i think you know even there it was still a pretty good experience mm-hmm. but yeah it, the, the big thing there is just like yeah avatar studios feels real because they actually put on events where they showed the logo <laughs> Um, so that's good. Um, so yeah, it, it's just, it's just great to hear all the stuff about the the concert. I, everyone I've heard talk about it says it's great, and to to just see the the change in about a year, just with the soundtrack going from like, will it ever happen to, we have book one released and a touring concert uh, performance. So that's super cool. A uh, final piece of news before we get into uh, Netflix Avatar is Netflix Avatar news. And so the big news that happened, uh, this was on the on the eve of what was it, two or three weeks after launch, they confirmed that they will be getting Netflix Avatar season two and three. Uh, I think we were all maybe just expecting the first season, but no, they, they, they gave them both uh, future seasons uh, announced at the same time no real information outside of a um, little logo of like earth symbol with a two in it fire symbol with a three in it and then some of the outlets seem to suggest that um it is the plan to kind of film these uh, pretty much back to back which i think makes a lot of sense now that they have the confirmation of this they don't want to mess around with the the timing stuff that uh, kind of comes into play a little bit with season one but um this is good I, i'm very happy about this i think season one was good enough to justify them getting to season two and three and i think they'll have a better time doing this with the feedback from season one and i think doing them back to back as well so I'm very happy to see that we got this. We're, we're going to get a finished live action version finally. That's good. But uh, what are your thoughts on the show getting renewed for its full run, basically? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's great. I think, you know, I'm of the similar mind that I think it was, you know, good enough. It got enough buzz. It seemed to generate enough, you know, sort of noise in the fandom, both good and bad, in order to sort of warrant, you know, having the, the attention and the, the you know, continued budget to continue the production so i think it's definitely worthwhile for them to keep it going yeah i think you know even though we might have only thought they would have only got like maybe one and continue testing out i think you know with the way the story goes and i think you know them hopefully sort of banking on the sort of popularity that it will generate um you know, it's, it's worth it for them to continue it on you no know, regardless of the you know like the the actors and actresses sort of like ages so that things sort of stay you know a bit sort of in sync there um, so no, I think it's definitely cool that it's going forward more. So I'm looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we'll move into the review now. So of course, we're going to be reviewing um, N103 Omashu, the third episode of uh, season one of Netflix Avatar. But first, um, since of course the last um, podcast, um, there's obviously been a lot more time to actually check out the episodes. Um, uh, I've finally managed to get through most of the, the coverage I wanted to do on it on the channel. That's why there's been such a gap between podcasts. But uh, we can find, I suppose, more generally, like have some overall thoughts on the season uh, here on the podcast. So uh, my own thoughts, uh, just to quickly sum them up, I've talked about it kind of so much, are that I, I like <laughs> I said, I, I think the show is pretty good. Um, I don't think it's like excellent, but I also don't think it's bad. Um, I just think it's pretty consistently like good, okay, solid. I, I don't think there's that many like amazing kind of moments 
But there's also not really that many bad moments. It's just a, a consistent level uh, that's, I think, good enough to obviously warrant doing uh, more of it. There's definitely some problems when it comes to the, the writing about like how few episodes there are. And, and some stuff does suffer because of that. Uh, just trying to go, in my mind, like completely against the grain on what season one is with uh, trying to do this more kind of serialized approach here, which this episode, episode three, kind of starts the sense of like, oh, OK, we're really cramming some stuff together here. Um, but <laughs> I enjoy watching this show. I, I don't have a hard time watching it. It's um, uh, that's why I struggle maybe with some of the negativity that that is out there. That's on the kind of more extreme end of things. I'm glad that it seems to have settled on just about like fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, where it's like 60 on the <laughs> dot. And I'm, I'm like, it deserves to be, I think, considered fresh because it's a, a valiant attempt at live action. And I'm glad it's at least being acknowledged as a, a decent platform to kind of build off. Uh, but uh, what are your more general thoughts uh, on the show, uh, given that you'd only seen the first two episodes when we did the first two podcasts recording? Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, I have seen the whole thing. And yeah, I think... I think for the most part, I'm of the same mind there, where I think, you know, it's, it's doing things in sort of an even keel sort of way that sort of pushes, you know, this live action version of the narrative well enough based off of what it's trying to sort of tell in a story. Because I think, you know, if you're definitely trying to go one for one with the original series, I can definitely, you know, understand there where some beats sort of might miss for you. Um and I think for me, the story overall is okay enough. Like, I think, you know, they're warping it towards their sort of, you know, overall sort of, you know, end game of the, the episodes that they have and the runtime that they have, right? Like, they're not they're not basing it off of, you know, the original 20-whatever sort of episodes. So I think for the most part, that sort of works for me. I think there are some parts with some characters where I can definitely understand and agree with where some people are more like, eh, that doesn't quite feel as well and... Some of that I can understand. Some of that I think maybe they're sort of too key into sort of the original series, but like it's understandably it's like it's kind of hard to separate the two. So I definitely see the the arguments there. But for me personally, I think it was fine. Like I I watched the whole thing through. I you know enjoyed it enough. And I definitely you know even when I you know have gone back now to like rewatch these episodes, like they don't sort of like you know irk me to, to the nth degree that I'm like, eh, that doesn't feel right at all. So I think for the most part, it, it worked for me. I think I definitely, you know, would recommend it to other people to check it out and see if it's something that, you know, suits their fancy, um, you know, comparing it to the, the original series just to see how it turns out for them. And at the very least, it seems to have accomplished the general goal of just getting people interested in Avatar. It seems like the crossover from people watching the live action to actually either going back to rewatch the original or just watching the original for the first time and even people then going on to mm -hmm. Korra I've, I've actually seen quite a bit of it there has definitely been a kind of franchise resurgence uh, certainly after this because I do think <laughs> the the focus on the live action kind of really only lasted like three and a bit weeks and then once that kind of fell off it has been like oh people are talking about avatar and actually some of this stuff coming up like avatar fortnite all these other crossovers the fact that there's info on a mobile game it, this stuff is actually being timed i think reasonably well here it's just um avatar studios could you could you say something here to like you know finish the job here in terms of like oh and by the way if you stick around there'll be more avatar animated stuff like the, it feels like they should have said something <laughs> but they haven't um so there is that but yeah, let, let's get into talking about this one. So like I said, episode three, Omashu. The general breakdown again of the show is that they kind of do it in two episode story arcs. So we've been through the first one um, with the opener and Warriors. This is the start of this Omashu two-parter with episode four, Into the Dark. Um, in general, I think this one's actually pretty well written overall like it is one of these episodes that mashes a bunch of episodes together we've got jet in here randomly like the northern air temple is here set in omashu interestingly the boomy stuff is 
the second part of this like we see boomy at the end here but he's not really the focus in this part so this is very much like a an original episode here with how we put things together but it's actually pretty well done but the weird thing about it is that this also is like probably the the least important episode in the series in terms of like this is the one that actually tries to put some of the more fillery episodes together and not be just laser focused on the plot so it's a weird one where it's actually very solid but um and not the most interesting content and but it's not the worst episode i i, I definitely think that I, i'd actually put probably the fourth episode and probably even the seventh episode below this one because i think it does enough interesting to be kind of interesting that if we had more time more episodes uh and we kind of did more of the episodes um from the original like this like we had maybe 10 episodes I think we could have actually built to something a little bit better. I do think this one is a little bit let down by 104 being kind of on the weaker end of things. But what are your general thoughts on Omashu? Yeah, I think, I don't know, I remember us, you know, when we originally did the first two, you was like, oh yeah, episode three is where things start to get sort of a change. And I think for me, the change in this episode didn't really bother me too much i think you know it was this is sort of like the introduction to omashu which is you know very much so like you know what we had in the original series just here we have you know additional characters and we do learn you know a bit about them and see them sort of interacting with our main sort of cast here so i like this sort of you know i guess sort of initial introduction meeting of you know these different sort of new characters that you know if you've watched the original series you know them already but here we're seeing them in sort of one place sort of all together and we're getting little bits and pieces of them and sort of you know expanding a little bit on sort of the sort of like history interaction of our sort of like original characters here so it was it was cool to actually get to see that here and there's some parts where i think you know there actually is a little bit more sort of like depth added that we sort of didn't even have sort of in the original sort of series because that wasn't really the the focus wasn't really sort of on the characters there it was more sort of the overall sort of journey here so i like that they took sort of like a a step back here to sort of you know get the meet the characters and understand them at least a a little bit more here Mm. yeah because it it definitely is a clever move to place more importance on omashu as like the the second biggest uh, city in the earth kingdom given how they actually end the season with the fall of omashu happen like being shown on screen rather than it being shown as we arrive to return to omashu and um, that actually i think works um pretty well it's uh, just some of the sort of writing stuff i suppose we'll get into here so um yeah we'll, we'll do our usual style here we'll kind of recap each scene and kind of discuss it so uh, we open up here very, very interestingly with some of the new stuff here, uh, our first like Azula scene. But uh, in general, everything here is a little bit new. So we have here in the Fire Nation capital, um, the Resistance meets. Um, they are united against the Fire Lord and the current direction of the war-focused Fire Nation. They have all lost too much. Uh, the leader here, his name is Tan. Um, he says that they will strike tonight and he introduces everyone to a new ally that they have uh, this girl who uh, works in the palace it's actually undercover azula and um, and uh, yeah she works in the palace she says that she lost her mother and brother in the siege of bossing say and so that's why she's united with them and we see tan rally the group and reveal what the plan actually is and he says fire lord ozai must die tonight so completely brand new scene uh debut of azula debut of the resistance within the fire nation here actually a very very interesting scene but uh, what were your thoughts on how they opened up this side of the plot yeah i don't think this is something i necessarily sort of like expect to see sort of the the rebellion inside of the fire nation directly and by their own sort of you know citizens at that so that's definitely interesting to see sort of the that there's more unrest than we might have sort of expected at least i don't necessarily you know would have thought of this like of course there always is regardless of any regime especially one that's you know sort of oppressive right so it's not surprising that there is one but it's not necessarily something i thought that they were going to show but that's sort of the whole overall theme of the show right like we're going down sort of like a different path than we sort of saw in the original series so i thought that was pretty cool and yeah you 
interesting to get to see sort of like Azula before you really know her. And depending on if you remember who the actress is from like all the sort of like news and stuff that was going on, you might not necessarily remember, but it does feel like it's more of like a, a setup type scene regardless. So you're probably sure that this isn't going to work the way that, you know, they wanted to be, but it's still, you know, cool to see how they were at least sort of trying to do something against sort of the establishment right now Mm -hmm. yeah just interesting to see them really focus on the idea of like they've all lost too much this will come up in the next scene as scene as well so i guess all these people have lost friends and family in the war like people drafted into the army and stuff like that and even azula saying that she lost her mother and brother is super interesting because it's like it's it's part of her lie and her cover but it's like true like where is Ursa? Where is Zuko? Um, not here in the Fire Nation. She technically has lost them both to the war, and in a way, very specifically to the siege of Bossing Say, because that's kind of what causes the the sequence of events to kind of the dominoes to fall to to make this all happen. So it's actually that's a clever little line there with Azula. Um, but we continue this scene. So. Azula does lead them into the palace that night. They enter the throne room, uh, but soon they are surrounded by guards as Ozai arrives uh, fully prepared to deal with. He questions their plan that, you know, you must have known that this was a one-way trip. Surely you didn't expect to escape even if you had managed to kill me. Like, my guards would have got you, basically. Um, Tan says that uh, decent Fire Nation citizens would be happy to be freed from his tyranny. Um, Ozai disagrees, saying that he has brought prosperity to the Fire Nation, um, that they are the best nation in the world, and that uh, by winning the war, they will bring peace. Tan asks, how many more must die? There's been too much loss. And uh, interestingly, Ozai gets quite angry at this and says, do not speak to me of loss. So uh, we'll get to what happens after that in just a second, but just uh, the first scene with Ozai, effectively, um, interesting uh stuff here just seeing this argument basically that happens here that ozai actually responds to tan here um over this defends um basically um saying kind of uh similar stuff to um what iro talked to ang about in one of the previous episodes like like what what are your thoughts on the war iro and he basically says what ozai says here which is sort of interesting but um what are your thoughts on uh, what happens here yeah, I think this is a, a cool bit of interaction that we don't necessarily, you know, have ever seen before. Sort of the, you know, talking to the the ruling leader and sort of, you know, getting, you know, at least, you know, from their point of view, their sort of like justification for things, right? Which is, mm-hmm. you know, nothing particularly new in terms of, you know, like world leaders type of domination situation but just to to see how you know one might at least attempt to sort of justify sort of their goings on here and you know sort of this rebel leader sort of coming to the front with him so i thought that was pretty you know intriguing to see that sort of set up here considering we don't necessarily get to see you know like regular people sort of talking to the the world leaders um doesn't amount as to much but you know at least it's there mm-hmm. um and I suppose really specifically, like, what are your thoughts on Ozai's reaction to the whole idea of, like, don't speak to me about loss? Because with Ozai, as we go on, like, we tackle the whole idea of, in later episodes, the idea of, like, um, he doesn't like the idea of, like, compassion and that he feels like the, the strong have to basically, like, defeat the weak, or st- like, sacrifice the weak to go on. Is that what he's talking about? Or is this like about what he had to do to Zuko? Is this about Ursa to a certain degree? Because there's a few scenes as we go through with Ozai where they kind of almost allude to the idea of like Ozai's lost someone in some way. So what do you make of his kind of almost surprisingly like, he kind of loses his cool a little bit at Tom saying this to him. Yeah, no, you're right. I don't know, it feels interesting with his character because it does feel like sometimes where he's trying to be sort of like, you know, fully emotionless and sort of, you know, passive with all the situation and just sort of dealing on the fact that things are the most, you know, the powerful will sort of rise to the top, right? But it definitely feels like there's, I don't know, maybe this is them sort of trying to show that maybe he is a bit more sort of complicated or, you know, there's some sort of underlying sort of conflict there that, you know, we're not really sort of aware of right now, but it's, it's there and, you know, at certain times it can sort of seep through the cracks there because it, it definitely feels like there was a, 
a bit more to that than we might have expected. So I wonder if there is more sort of backstory that we're going to get on him than we you know already sort of know. Mm. Yeah, like I wonder, like if if maybe the what exactly happens with Azulon is maybe slightly differently done here. Um, but we'll see what happens, I guess. Um, so the next part of this scene is that uh, this is this is the point where Azula reveals herself. She steps out from the group, turns around. She's on Ozai's side, of course. Uh, she has led the resistance to their doom here, and so we basically just watch as Ozai burns them alive, literally just sets them on fire, and they go up. Um, Tan, right as this is happening, does say his kind of final line here, saying that um, he's going to put his hope in the return of someone who will bring balance to the world. And he's basically about to say the Avatar, but he dies basically before he can get that out. Um, this is when Ozai realizes that like oh, Azula's a little bit confused. What, what's going on here? Why did they say that? That sounds like the Avatar. Ozai gives her Zhao's message confirming the return of the Avatar. And immediately we see some of the conflict here of Azula is annoyed that, oh, well, Zuko's partly succeeded here, like the Avatar has been found. And Ozai kind of really lets her know that he's aware of this, that like, oh, Z Zuko, against all odds, has kind of succeeded. What have you done? Even though she's literally just done something quite impressive right there. <laughs> and so Azula immediately feels like she has to do more to stand out. And we, we, we begin to see Ozai playing basically Azula against Zuko because of course the reveal at the end is that he doesn't actually care about Zuko even though he's giving praise to Zuko in this scene it's mainly to stoke the fire in Azula here overall um so what are your thoughts on this scene Azula revealing her turn and um some plot elements beginning to come into play here yeah it definitely does feel like we're starting to get to the point where we're seeing how you know sort of the domino pieces are going to fall together here and this you know the fact that at least you know it seems like people are aware you know even in this sort of reaches of the world that there's you know an avatar that has been found to some degree recently even if they're not sort of fully on the level of what's really there is you know it's the fact that it's inspiring hope and of these people and that's something that you know the fire lord of course can't have and he knows the truth of it as well so it's interesting to see azula here and her sort of i guess initial reaction to this i thought that was pretty intriguing to see how there's you know there's this conflict between the two siblings here that we didn't necessarily get to understand as much before or at least not in this sort of way so the fact that there is that sort of you know back and forth being played off directly with each other I think it's something that is, you know, can go either way in terms of, you know, you sort of thinking it's a, a favorable thing or not particularly being interested in it. And I've seen it both ways from a lot of different people. Mm. Yeah, because it is a weird one because I think it's it's completely correct on Ozai's side of things to a certain degree. But there's maybe a little bit of a question of like, this far after the banishment, would Ozai even care enough about Zuko to use him in this way, like, at all? And um, mm. does does he have to always manipulate Azula to get what he wants? And have they overly portrayed Azula like early on as being too on edge about this situation where as her introduction in like book two is like supreme confidence. And admittedly, of course, we, we get introduced to her not next to Ozai. And so that's kind of part of the problem here is that we don't have as many scenes with Azula and Ozai just directly interacting. So it's like, is this how it typically is? Like, because we, we, we always talk about the idea that clearly Ozai made her like this, using stuff like this, but shouldn't this be a little bit further in the past when, you know, the, he did more directly manipulate her? Should she not be confident already at this point, this close to the her big kind of uh, action as a, as a character that that should have been like shortly after Zuko's banishment or having already occurred prior to that. Um, that's just the, the kind of the timing situation here of like, it's not wrong what the presentation is, but um, is it right to have Azula be so cautious on edge um skeptical of everything happening? That, that That's kind of part of the question here is that, but uh, do you have any more thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, I do wonder that. I, I mean, I wonder if that's just them sort of, you know, 
reorder reordering sort of like when these sort of events sort of happen so we're seeing it sort of like in its progress here versus before like you said it was it was just already sort of done and we were you know already knew that azula was you know sort of like the perfect you know at least in her opinion the perfect sort of person to carry out her sort of task here so it definitely does feel you no know, odd from that regard here i mean i don't know i it doesn't bother me too much that he's sort of you know using this towards his own means to sort of play off of it because it seems to affect Azula, right? So if it's a method that works, then I can't see, you know, as I not using it. Um, it just seems weird in terms of like the overall sort of timing of things, but you know, they're switching things around. Mm -hmm. And then we cut over to Team Avatar here. So Katara is trying to do the water whip technique for the first time, but can't quite get it. Aang does explain that to do difficult bending moves, you really have to let the energy flow. You have to tap into your feelings, which is what Katara is struggling with because she kind of reveals here that's what's been happening recently with her is that when she tries to do bigger water bending moves, um, if she kind of connects to the feelings of basically what happened to her mother, which is obviously um, very bad feelings and that's uh, getting in the way of this. So they're doing the the flow like water kind of arc with Katara here, not Aang as you might maybe expect them to, but it, it's kind of interesting what they do in this episode uh, with it overall. Um, and then we end this scene with Aang trying to kind of cheer her up and stuff like this, talking about how he never listened to his teachers and uh, he makes a couple of jokes, but it's, it's clear Katara is definitely deep in thought about this. Struggling, has she reached a plateau with her water bending? How can she move on from here? And that's the kind of arc we're going for here. But uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, water bending? Yeah, I thought this was a good one to sort of start the idea of, you know, Katara's training, she has some skills, she's, you know, somewhat proficient already, right? But she still has, you know, a lot to go, and there's this huge sort of mental block, which is sort of the the true line for her character in this episode, right? Like she has to overcome this thing and you know, it's even more than just this episode, like it's a thing with her sort of character and sort of being comfortable with water bending and herself and sort of her you know, her confidence overall is something that, you know, at least for, you know, this series they're trying to show that that's something that, you know, she still needs to develop and sort of uh, come to terms with, which even in the original one, she had to do that as well. So I thought that was a good way to have them sort of interact here. I think it, you know, it would have been cool to see sort of, Aang, you know, of course, like we saw in the original one, to have some more sort of interaction with the, the water here. But they're, you know, I guess I don't begrudge them to sort of try to focus on just Katara and her sort of abilities here, especially considering by the end of the episode how she's actually able to use it in sort of a high pressure situation. So I like that they're at least showing the, the overall arc of her progression in her water bending for this episode and where she gets to by the end of it. Hmm. Yeah, my, my thing is that, like, I think within this episode, the arc is fine. It's just that in future episodes, it does feel like this is the only arc that they have for her. That it, it, it always comes back to the memories of her mother and that they explore it reasonably well here. But then episode five, let's just tell the whole backstory without the significance of the Southern Raiders. And um, other than that, her arc mainly does revolve just around water bending. But then they, they want to not do the training. In general, I think training is something that the show seems to struggle with a little bit. Um, one of the main criticisms, of course, is that Aang never once attempts to uh, train waterbending at all in this season. Uh, we end with him ever actually doing any of it, which is kind of weird. Katara, apart from her own training on her own, is never trained by anyone really like Aang gives her some minor instruction in the early episodes uh, and then even the Azula stuff we'll get to is kind of like uh, is this effective training does this lead to anything and um, so th th there's some weird stuff in this when like it just gets into I think a bigger character arc thing of like the show is a bit repetitive when it comes to the character arc stuff because in the original it's not like every single episode we address Aang's arc Katara's arc, Sokka's arc. It's more of scattered across the 20 episodes. There are moments when each character comes into focus and you explore a different aspect of them, whether it be directly related to their big character arc, the serious stuff, or just a fun side to their character. Whereas they try to serialize it here to where every episode has to focus on a thing for each character. 
and I don't think it works as well for other char- some characters as, as others. So I think Sokka's of the main three characters is like the best. Katara's I think is the worst because it's the most repetitive. And then Aang's is also very repetitive, but at least because he's the Avatar, there's a few different like angles on it. Um, but we'll, we'll see kind of as we as we go on that like that's kind of part of what they do. I think it is mainly other episodes. This is just maybe the first one where you start to see them reusing the plot threads. But um, the next scene that immediately follows on from this is that we see Sokka looking at the fan that Suki gave him. And Katara actually notes that, hey, look, I liked her too. Uh, this is when Aang spots something flying around in the distance. He thinks it might be a surviving airbender. And so they're heading for Omashu. So this is a pretty quick transition scene, but I, I like the acknowledgement of like, hey, Suki was important from the last episode. Let's acknowledge that. Um, but uh, any thoughts on this quick scene? Yeah, yeah. It, it is good that they gave some, I guess, sort of credence to, you know, that they all interact with her and there's, you know, there's maybe some sort of future there with Saka, but, you know, we don't really know where that's sort of gonna go. But yeah, it's good. I mean, it, also, it's just good just to see that, you know, since the show is pretty sort of, you know, fast pace overall in terms of getting from a to b and b to c and whatnot it's good to see them just sort of like in the air sort of on their way to some sort of location even if we don't really have a a sense of scale of the Mm. like timing it actually took to get there but you know at least there's some indication you know at some points that they're traveling in journeys and stuff like that so they can't do that as much as they can in the original one. Mm. Yeah, yeah, we, we show it early on here, um, but then it gets it quite it gets quite heavily contrasted with like the start of episode five, where like it's implied they've done basically the entire rest of book one, like in between episodes. Um, but uh, next scene is um, Zhao wants to use his contacts in the area to find Ang, but Zuko is quite cautious about this uh, because he doesn't want anyone else to know about the Avatar even though it's already starting to spread. So he reluctantly agrees to this because they point out that if Aang goes too far north, we just have no real ability to find him. Um, So we, of course, get the idea. Zuko doesn't like Zhao. Lieutenant G speaks up and is kind of like, hey, uh, I heard Zhao failed his officer exam three times. But interestingly, Zuko kind of like snaps at G and is just like, no, we have to have like respect for like the command structure. You shouldn't be allowed to criticize a, a, a higher ranking officer that way. So Zuko, and we see this kind of again later on, like Zuko maintaining this like sense of like Fire Nation honor about like traditions, military protocol, and despite like him being banished and maybe should you care about this so much? And, you know, it's just a bit of an interesting point. But um, yeah, this is mainly just like, setting everyone into the right position in terms of like okay they're on the trail of finding out that omashu is going to be the target and we'll, we'll get caught up with that a little bit later on but uh, do you have any thoughts on this scene yeah this is i don't know it's interesting seeing zhao and zuko interact and we get you know to see more of this as we go on um it's interesting to see how in this one they're taking their sort of like at odds with each other but they're able to sort of sometimes work but it's really just you know sort of Ira who's there who's sort of like being the mediator between them and sort of you know actually making things sort of like work you know more smoothly than they probably would if it was just sort of like Zuko on his own so he's sort of just sort of grudgingly sort of like working with this sort of commanding officer but yeah I mean you know Zuko's always a whole bunch of like sort of back and forth sort of contradictions right like he's he has his honor he has his code but he also you know has to do things to get what he sort of wants and you know, it doesn't necessarily involve or he doesn't want it to involve many other people so it's you know he goes back and forth but you know that whole sort of struggle is what makes him sort of interesting even in this iteration of him mm-hmm. uh, next we see the introduction of omashu so uh, we're gonna head in through the uh, the main gate here um, Ang talks about uh, his experience with the city from the past, of course, and he thinks it's great. Um, right now, there's, of course, a giant queue of people trying to get in, and the guards are very strict. Uh, this is where Jet introduces himself and says that, uh, yeah, they don't like outsiders in Omashu, so you probably won't be let in, basically. So Katara asks for his help, and he agrees, so they kind of 
get some slight changes of clothes here and uh, they're going to go in sort of together um, overall. He does note at this point that uh, there is caution here in Omashu because the Fire Nation have uh, not yet been able to take Omashu and of course they want to keep it that way. Um, and then we get the sequence of like, how does Jet manage to kind of speak his way past the guards here and explain these new people? And he manages to kind of get them through by kind of saying like, Katara is his wife and uh, Sokka is his uh, brother-in-law who can't actually speak. And Aang is just kind of hidden under the cart, basically. Um, so this is sort of meant to be our Bonzu Pippin Paddle Optocopolis, uh, the third kind of scene, just altered with the addition of jet but i think it works pretty well they, they knew to make it a bit of a funny scene getting in and um it it works out pretty nice as a kind of alternate way to to meet up with uh, jet for the first time uh, and uh other than that um omashu and just in general a lot of the locations when they introduce them with the establishing shot really good like they, that's one of the best things about this show is that they know how to introduce the locations in a really cool looking way but uh your thoughts on the arrival at omashu yeah no I, I agree with that it's definitely a really cool sort of vista getting to see it from afar and then to get to it sort of up close there but yeah i think you know i don't i think the them getting into it i think it, it works well enough for what they're sort of going for here i think you know if it was just them on their own the way that they've sort of have framed things in this show so far I wouldn't really expect them to get in because they, they really do stand out that much. And it, it does really seem like the city is a lot more sort of on edge than, you know, it was in the original series. I mean, that's sort of the whole thing of the show in general. Like, it has that sort of, like, edge to it that the original sort of cartoon didn't necessarily have. So the fact that they do have to sort of use another person to sort of get into the city um, because they weren't prepared to sort of, like, you know, alter their outfits or anything like that. Um, I think that sort of works for me here. And, you know, just the fact that they meet this new sort of character that we know, you know, later on has more interactions with them and we can see the whole sort of play off of each other thing there. I think that for me works pretty well here. I think they, they definitely, like you said, they, they play it up for sort of laughs here and that sort of, you know, as a bit of sort of levity to this already sort of like tense sort of situation, right? Mm hmm. Then they go in and we get kind of another establishing shot showing the insides of the city with the delivery system and just the, the fact that it's kind of built on, on, to, on top of a mountain, basically. Uh, really, really nice looking. We also see the, the markets of Omashu, which we'll be in a bit later on. Um, so Jet at this point kind of like goes off not before saying that, hey, the city can be a bit dangerous, so be cautious. Uh, then Aang spots his... Uh, potential air nomad and runs off in pursuit eventually finding out that it is this uh, young boy in a glider wheelchair not an air nomad so just before they can introduce themselves an explosion goes off behind them and the team kind of rushes to help everyone kind of get to safety uh, at this point uh, the boy whose name is Teo of course and um, his father arrives and they kind of rush into their house so this is our introduction of the mechanist and uh, Teo um uh, and it's just, you know, arrival in the city and getting the kind of plot going here. Um, we'll find out the details surrounding a lot of this stuff in the, the following. But uh, interesting, they're, they're, they're keeping it moving along um, pretty nicely overall here. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice introduction, Teo. But uh, what are your thoughts on, on this stuff? Yeah, it, it was a pretty good way to start it off. Because, I mean, it's, it's pretty sort of like action oriented. Like we get, you know, the immediate sort of vistas. And I think it's cool to get to see sort of the, the life in the city and the market, at least from the, the ground floor here and how everything sort of, you know, you get a little bit of an idea when you see like Aang sort of like running through. And, you know, of course, we get the obligatory, of course, running to the cabbage merchant and stuff like that. So it's, it's cool to get to see that sort of bit here. And, you know, it, it's like a little bit of fun until it gets really sort of, you know, back to serious and what's really, you know, like the the plot, the sort of meat of this sort of episode here. So I thought that was cool to get to see that. And, you know, just a sort of tile, you know, sort of being sort of like the, the cool sort of or the sort of wide eyed kid getting to see, you know, an airbender and sort of a waterbender, which, you know, grand is probably something you don't get to see in the city a lot. So it's, it's cool to get to see that sort of like initial sort of reaction here, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so inside, we get the, the situation. 
So Teo explains that this is the uh, latest of many bombings that have been taking place in the city recently. Uh, he explains that there are Fire Nation spies all over the city that are likely behind these bombings. And um, so Katara kind of b immediately begins to connect the dots over this, combined with what Jet was saying that the city's dangerous. And um, of course, Teo's excited that Aang is an airbender. Uh, he notes that this means they can fight back against the Fire Nation because their weakness is air power. Uh, Sokka immediately talks about how impressed he is by all the machines and blueprints from the Mechanist, because we get the reveal here that um, Sai is the name of the Mechanist, but he is the Mechanist to the King of Omashu, that's his position here. Um, and he maintains key parts of the city, including the delivery system, and we just get across the idea of how proud Teo is of all of the advancements and um, everything that his father does to help the city. And that if everyone were as dedicated as his father, that the Fire Nation would have lost already. But we see that Sai gets a little bit kind of evasive every time the Fire Nation gets brought up by Teo. Uh, so there's something more going on here. But the gang do immediately head out because they feel they have other things to do rather than stick around here. Um, so um, the, the plot's kind of beginning to come together here. We see that there's uh, bombings spies in the city and uh, maybe more um, but uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the the proper introduction here of like the mechanist and Teo yeah no, I, I thought this was a pretty you know good introduction to them I we get the sort of understand their characters their roles and sort of you know see our other characters sort of interact with them for the first time there's you know not too much because we don't know sort of how much we're going to be involved with them quite yet but there's there's just enough that we can see that there's a little bit more to these characters, right? And the fact that they chose to make the mechanist sort of part of the, the city itself, I think is, you know, interesting to see that sort of level of, I guess, sort of interaction, which with what they do later on, it makes sort of sense. It's not necessarily something I would have thought of, but it does give his character at least a little bit more sort of like, I guess you could say like credibility in terms of his sort of abilities. It doesn't make him quite as much of sort of like a, a mad hatter that we sort of thought of him from before so i like that they sort of you know even if he does seem kind of quirky um which is fine that's that's the cool part of him you know there is sort of like a a grounding of him as well in terms of his actual you know, sort of roles and responsibilities as which of course gets expanded upon you know later on in the episode mm -hmm. uh next the, the gang outside uh ang sees all the injured people the aftermath of the the bombing and he's kind of just stunned by how much has changed in Omashu. Even reflecting on the previous scene, there's this sense of like, Teo was talking about everything from the perspective of value in war. Uh, and that's the complete opposite of the way he remembers Omashu. So Ang feels that this is a necessary side quest to do. That they have to stay here and try and solve this um, issue going on in the city about the bombings and, and the spies and stuff like that. So they basically go back inside and are like, hey, explain to us what's going on in the city. So this is sort of Aang kind of stepping up the kind of responsibility kind of aspect of like, he, he feels he has to fix things here, even though he has a more immediate thing to get to the north. This is this is required. So I, I do like that. But uh, your thoughts on this scene? I think this is like, this is where we get to see, you know, Aang really sort of understand or at least become the sort of grasp to understand of like sort of the the war and the effort and to see sort of at least where he thinks his actual places and things. So I like that he's actually sort of like, you know, he's he's stepping up to the plate, right? Like this is him actually sort of trying to actively engage with things and, you know, he he definitely, you know, understands that this is, you know, there's is a place where he can sort of help things, um, to some degree at least. Mm hmm Uh next we cut back over to Azula and so what we see is, is here is her basically venting to Mei and Tai Li about how Ozai has praised Zuko while it's actually Azula who has done so much here in the Fire Nation. And she's saying that as she is doing archery training basically with the Yu Yan archers and seems to be just as good as the Yu Yan archers at archery. Um, just, just highlighting the, the, the casual skill set that she has uh, in everything. Um, so 
they then, her friends ask her about, you know, how was your mission that you were just on? And Azula basically just dismisses it. It was easy. It was nothing. Um, that she thinks about how all Zuko is wants, basically, is to take away everything from Azula that she has worked for. May notes that, uh, well, Zuko technically is first in line, but quickly has to add in to stop Azula from being angry. That uh, Not that he deserves it. Um, so... Um, Azula points out that, uh, well, Zuko has hope now, and that's what makes it dangerous. And so she needs to figure out a way to get involved in the game, basically out there while still being in the Fire Nation. So she goes to the note because she was firing arrows basically at it um, and realizes, oh, there is a piece I can use here. Zhao, who Ozai dismissed in the previous scene as being just some random guy. She's like, oh, I can influence Zhao to influence Zuko. And, and that's how she's going to play things. So um, this is an interesting scene here because um, overall, Azula in this show, I think it is a little bit of a mixed presentation. I love the infiltration stuff from the start. I actually really like where this plot with her influencing Zhao goes. I think a lot of the scenes that are just Azula talking to Main Tai Li feel really not required. Mainly because they never introduce Mei and Tai Li. They never tell you their names in the show. Um, you only know who they are if you're already a fan of the series or look at the credits. Um, it's nothing on the uh, actors because I think there's little bits of characterization here. But they don't really get to do anything except be the people Azula vents. And it makes me feel that like it was a mistimed kind of introduction of the characters that you probably should have just waited to include these characters later on because I think it works better for Azula's plot that it is just her being influenced by Ozai and she's kind of in her own head about it rather than Mei and Tai Li who seem to be able to kind of see through the idea that like it is just Ozai messing with her from the start but she doesn't listen to them so I get why they probably wanted to cast everyone together all at the same time, and you probably didn't want to do it when you didn't know you had season two, but uh, I do feel they could have done a better job at like just actually introducing May and Tai Li and making them interesting here, because especially Tai Li, I don't think you get too much of the uniqueness of her character. At least May gets little bits and pieces to shine where she's like flipping a knife around and she's positive, talking positively about Zuko and she tends to speak up around Azula a little bit more. You don't quite get that with Tai Li and it's just, um, I, it just feels like, okay, we'll bring up all the characters earlier, but did we need to do it is kind of the question. So um, for me, the, there's a little bit of the kind of mixed approach here of just like, Save some stuff for later. I think it's perfectly fine. But uh, what are your thoughts on, on the introduction of uh, May and Ty Lee? Here? Yeah, no, I, I definitely get your your point there. As far as like we're not, you know, we don't really get to know them that much. We just get to see them sort of, you know, rift off of Azula, which you know I don't think is necessarily the worst thing. But you know, if we're really trying to get to know those two as a characters, you know this episode and even the, the rest of the show there's you know there's not much more that we can do with them no i guess you know eventually we will get more to that but it's yeah it is a, a bit you know a bit of a letdown considering how cool the characters are normally right which is that's the the main letdown there because we know that they're really sort of interesting and they can do more but i don't know i guess it doesn't bother me too much that they're like a soundboard for azula because you know this is the point where we're sort of you know, we're thinking that this is like maybe earlier on in her sort of, you know, I guess development sort of conflict rival with Zuko and stuff like that. And, you know, she's able to sort of figure out that there is sort of a key thing that she can sort of use to sort of influence the situation, which I think is, you know, kind of cool that they sort of went that route here, the more sort of communicative route um, manipulation that, you know, she can sort of do on her end here. So that part is kind of cool to see here. But yeah, they're definitely... I don't know, maybe they could have expanded upon it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, next, we get back to um, Teo, the mechanist, everyone. So Teo talks about his mother, um, who mentioned the Avatar. He remembers her talking about that. Um, he asked his father about this, but uh, Sai only remembers how she was taken away by the war. 
And so Teo knows that, like, he cares. He does also hate the Fire Nation. You know, basically, why else would he build all of this stuff if not to help back fighting the Fire Nation? And, of course, we focus on the balloon design, which Sai has not quite got working yet. And so there's a bit of a setup here for, okay, Sokka's going to help Sai with the balloon design. Teo and Aang are going to go off to investigate the bombing and because Teo has an idea of where they might be kind of hanging out um, and so everyone's kind of being put off in their different direction to investigate different aspects of uh, what's going on here so um, this is where you can definitely um, see the idea of like okay here's your it is multiple episodes kind of together and we see that okay <laughs> Sokka is going to interact with the mechanist but Aang and Katara are not really going to interact with him Katara is going to interact with Jet, but the other characters are not really going to interact with Jet. So, um, you're you're doing multiple episodes, but it's not like you're doing all of multiple episodes. And there's kind of pros and cons to that, in that like some of the depth is a little bit lost because it's basically just each character sort of almost like defending the character that they happen to know the best when they don't really know the other characters. Um, but it, it, it's it's overall pretty decent because I think it builds to a good Sokka mechanist scene and some good uh, Katara uh, jet scenes. It's just the original does work better because Team Avatar in completion gets to interact with Jet, whereas that's not quite the case here. Um, but still, uh, I interesting enough scene here of just setting up... Um, the mechanist reason to kind of dislike the fire nation and kind of what he does to protect people from what happened to him in the past um, but your thoughts on that this scene? yeah no the the mechanist i think i don't i think i really sort of you know in the new way that they sort of rejiggered this episode to work the way that they wanted to work i really do like the interactions and the setup here in the beginning of him with you know sort of saka and that sort of whole sort of you no know, sort of builder type angle that they're going for here and yeah there definitely is sort of you know less sort of depth that you have with the characters but i think you know there's enough for the characters themselves at least the ones that interacted with them where they can sort of you know understand why they sort of support you know their character or their sort of relationship that they sort of just formed within you know the time period of this episode here. So I don't know. I like that there's sort of a split there and that fact that they're, you know, at least at the very least, they're not trying to cram everything into one episode. Like they do split it out with the, the next episode as well. We just sort of get the sort of initial sort of, you know, our characters, our new sort of relationships here are the most sort of interesting ones. Mm -hmm. And there's a quick uh, kind of in-between scene here of uh, Zhao getting a report of an airbender in Omashu. So he wants to send basically everyone in, but uh, Zuko's like, nope, no, we're keeping things at a small scale here. I'll go in with my uncle instead. Zhao agrees, but he tells them that, hey, uh, no backup because you're in like a you know, enemy stronghold here. There's nothing I can do for you if you go in there and you get yourself captured. Um, so that's just bringing the, um, the kind of bad guy side of things into play here setting up that they're going to arrive in omashu and um, so yeah they, they, this all makes complete sense with zuko wanting to keep things on the down low but it's not going to last that long any thoughts on this scene yeah no it's just another sort of conflict of our sort of you know evil air quotes sort of characters right now what they're sort of trying to do I, I don't know i thought this was just sort of you know interesting i wonder if it went sort of the other way would it have turned out any differently? Like, I don't see how going there in force would have necessarily been sort of like any better in the situation, considering, you know, how long emotion she's been so far, unless they were, you know, unless they were like already in talks with sort of the, the spies that were already in the city or something like that, then that might have been sort of interesting. But no, I think they, they went the route that would have made them the most sense to mm -hmm. me. Uh, next scene, Katara is practicing the water whip again, but uh, still can't let her feelings flow. She then spots uh, the Mechanist meeting with a Fire Nation spy as Jet kind of appears behind her and kind of reveals that he's also spying on him, basically. Um, so uh, he knows the Mechanist is a traitor. So they follow the spy. And the reason they follow the spy and not the Mechanist is because basically Jet points out that the Mechanist is a coward. He won't take action himself. 
so he's not like particularly dangerous and so they're going to go after the spy who's the the threat here so we see him take out his swords and kind of effectively kind of reveals like hey look it's it's jet in his jet outfit and you know it's the the proper like ah this is who he is um (laughs) situation here so yeah the some of the more complex plotting of the episode beginning to kind of happen here a lot of the reveals coming out of like okay yes there are fire nation spies in the city okay the mechanist is working with them uh, which is accurate to the original episode and and makes sense in this version as well that um uh, based on the the logic we'll get later on but you know this is why he was acting very sketchy when the fire nation was brought up um but what are your thoughts on this scene yeah no this is cool to get to see sort of this you know particular way that they're going about sort of him working with the, the enemy within the own nation and he's a lot more closer to sort of the the ruling authority of the city here so that that makes it all the more sort of like dangerous intriguing that he's actually you know sort of you know working with the enemy here so i thought that was pretty cool to see how they're sort of setting that up mm-hmm. And next scene, we get a quick shot of uh, Aang and Teo flying up through Omashu and heading into one of the the higher caves on one of the higher levels of Omashu, because this is where they're going to investigate. I um, uh, don't think there's really much to say here, because it's, it's the next scene with them where actually something happens. Um, then immediately after that, we see Katara and uh, Jet arrive to find the spy waiting for them, and he's brought back up. It's a... Uh, three on two at the moment so but jed of course is impressive with his hook swords against the firebenders and katara fights pretty well also um but when it seems like they're you know gonna be maybe uh the the tables might be turned he gives a call and his crew the freedom fighters arrive so we get uh long shot pipsqueak the duke and smellerby all get kind of revealed here and uh we completely turn the tides here and we you know take everyone out basically um, and we see that Qatar is impressed by this but is a little bit kind of like hmm are they maybe going a little bit too far in what they're doing she needs to hear their kind of explanation on this so yeah here is the reveal of the full kind of uh freedom fighter situation um uh, that we have here which is, is very interesting to have this take place like literally in omashu but um your thoughts on this uh, action uh, piece that we have here yeah i mean the the action itself is is fine i like getting to see you know jet with his swords and how they sort of interpreted that to sort of work in the live action which i think you know for me works pretty well and to get to see the rest of the the freedom fighters come down i think you know I guess it's maybe not sort of like as, you know, sort of bombastic and in your face as sort of the original one was. But, you know, for what they're going for the show and sort of bring it down to this sort of level here, I think it it works pretty well. You get to see the kids and they seem to have, you know, sort of the the fun sort of action piece here against uh, the other adults who, you know, seem to be, you know, overall pretty strong, but they do get sort of surprised here. So, no, I, I thought this was a pretty good win. You know, get to see Katara have a little bit of sort of an action piece here, I think is it's nice to see as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, next, we get uh, Sokka uh, and Sai talking. And so we see that Sokka is actually a pretty impressive engineer. And the mechanist talks about, hey, oh, your, your father must be proud of you for this. But Sokka actually says that his father has other things to worry about uh, because his father's a warrior. The mechanist talks about how there are too many warriors in the world and not enough great engineers. Uh, And Sokka is, of course, uh, you know, a bit embarrassed at being called a great engineer. He says it's just a hobby. But uh, the mechanist is like, uh, says it's difficult to find your path in life, but when you find it, you must embrace it. Um, And basically the idea of Sokka must not ignore his engineering uh, talents is the core of this scene. Um, so Sokka's arc of the, the three main Team Avatar members is the one that to me over the course of the series works the best because it feels like we actually cover different kind of elements of his arc across different episodes whereas it, I think it is a little bit more repetitive with the other two. Um, but here of course we're getting the idea of here is this engineer side of him and maybe don't focus so much on being a warrior. But he just had the stuff with Suki in the last episode where, you know, she thinks he can be a good warrior. And we'll tackle different elements of this as we go on. But then there's also the more subtle stuff about, oh, we still need to address some of this stuff about, like, 
Hakoda, basically, seems to be presented in a bit of a different way than the original in all of this, based on the way we've kind of talked about it a bit. And so here, the idea that Hakoda apparently isn't as much of a kind of inventor himself uh, is a bit of an interesting one. He's more of a kind of straight warrior here, so no stink and sink uh, for this version of Hakoda, potentially, um, <laughs> is, a, is a bit of an interesting one. Um, just to add to Sokka's kind of worry about what if I'm not a good, good enough uh, warrior, effectively. But um, this is this is a, a very effective scene here. This is the the real kind of emotional core of the Sokka Sai side of the episode here for Sokka's character. So I think they definitely did this one pretty well. But uh, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I really like their sort of interaction that they have here, sort of, you know, almost sort of like early sort of mentorship for, for Sokka here in terms of like someone who more is on sort of his level of understanding things and the fact that he's able to sort of, you know, understand these sort of principles sort of, you know, pretty quickly in terms of like the engineering and sort of the visual here and sort of how he would have like, you know, used this sort of ideas back home for the things that, you know, he was tinkering with, right? So I like that they have this sort of, you know, connection here that I don't think we necessarily, you know, we saw that they have sort of the the back and forth sort of banter and sort of, you know, that sort of fun part of their sort of original sort of like builder engineering sort of connection here. But it feels like it's a bit sort of deeper here in terms of, you know, how Sokka really feels about himself and his character and sort of his his role in the world right like there's a bit more of that here so i i like that yeah because that's where in like the adaptation they, i think they've done a good job at transferring Sokka's arc where in the original like he has different bits and pieces across the, the various episodes of the original but they never overly focus uh, until like season three basically on the idea of like Oh yeah, like like where is his focus as a character? Is he the leader? Is he the warrior? Is he the plan guy? Um, here they bring it much more kind of upfront immediately of like yeah, what what is the direction for this character? And what they seem to settle on later on is the idea of um, a hero is kind of the the mix of everything together is is kind of what's uh, presented in this so that's interesting um but uh, next scene is ang and teo so they're in the cave and uh, teo explains that um because the explosion was green it must have used uh, tinkar salt which is why they're in this cave now that's where it comes from so teo praises his father for keeping them both alive and um, but teo wants more than just you know protecting keeping them safe they should do everything that they can to save the world so basically again the idea of why aren't the inventions being used to fight back against the Fire Nation? Why is it so just like, let's just defend what's going on here? So uh, very much the idea of like, Sai, protective father, but then Teo actually wants to go on the offensive um, is sort of the the arc here. But uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Teo here? Yeah, this was interesting to get sort of, you know, a more... I guess, you know, he, he really wants to sort of involve himself in the war. And I guess because he sees like what his father is capable of doing he feels like there's you know there's actually something they can do where most people feel like sort of like you know helplessness in the situation him despite you know sort of his you know sort of what he's already personally lost um you know really sees that there's something that can be sort of done um that he can do or that you know his father can do together so i I like that sort of part of his sort of character here and the fact that he's, you know, he has a little bit of smarts with him as well, of course. So he's able to sort of discern how things are actually sort of, you know, sort of put together in their composition. So I, I like that part. Mm -hmm. Next, we're back to Jet and Katara. So we're in the Freedom Fighters uh, hideout here, kind of in the trees. Um, and Katara asks the obvious question of like, hey, why are there firebenders in an Earth Kingdom city? Jet explains that the city has changed over time. That in the old days it did stand strong, but as the war dragged on, the king lost his nerve and let corruption spring up around him, and the Fire Nation came in through those cracks. And that's what the Freedom Fighters are basically here to do. They are going to deal with the firebenders who have got themselves involved in the city, um, and they have all lost someone to the Fire Nation, that they're all basically refugees and orphans. Uh, who want revenge effectively against uh, the Fire Nation. So that's the good presentation of the Freedom Fighters in, in this version here, is that they are the ones who <laughs> will actually try and deal with the Fire Nation spies, whereas the King seems to just be kind of 
allowing this to happen uh, because time has gone on for so long. Um, so interesting enough stuff. We'll obviously see this kind of get kind of reversed as the episode goes on. But um, what are your thoughts on Jet and Katara here? Yeah, yeah. There's sort of the, I guess, domestic sort of enforcers that are sort of trying to support things that have sort of been left to the wayside and he does a pretty good job of like trying to like present this sort of idea to Katara and you know it seems like she's you know more or less kind of sort of accepting of it and you know it seems like everyone there is really sort of like you know I guess sort of positive of this sort of situation of them you know sort of being the freedom fighters and sort of what they sort of stand for here so it's, it's interesting to get to see this sort of you know look this perspective from the freedom fighters and sort of all of these sort of kids sort of interacting and in this sort of, you know, basically it's sort of like mini village that they have here, right? So that's definitely something to see here and how they sort of set up this version of the village and how that's, you know, sort of different compared to the other ones. So I think it's it's cool to see how they're sort of playing off of this sort of situation mm. here. Yeah, like, um, it, it's good because, like, in the lore, we know that, like, Omashu in the original is important because, like, it... Um, the delivery systems are, are key to like supplying weapons to the the earth kingdom army across the uh the earth kingdom um and we know that it, it it is a place where like kind of refugees can also go but like they're actually focusing on it here to a certain degree which is um uh, nice to see but the next scene here is that uh, back with teo and ang they find the bombers camp teo finds all this blasting jelly uh which is a nice reference to the episode jet and um, ang then finds all the stuff from jet's cart which he knows quite well because he was in amongst it getting into the city and um, and then uh, <laughs> this is obviously the reveal that oh the firebenders were not the bombers so it's actually jet and co who are the bombers and that kind of goes against a little bit of what they were talking about before so there's uh, some confusion here with uh, who knows what and um, but uh, an interesting reveal like like th this is the good thing about this episode is that all these different plot threads coming together the order in which they do it it, it is actually well written the way it all kind of uh, pans out but your thoughts on the the reveal scene here yeah this is definitely something i think i don't know it's probably something you didn't necessarily thought we get revealed this quickly or this early or whatever but you no know, considering their sort of situation that they're going for here and know sort of what we've seen so far it seems like there's a lot more sort of i guess you could say like layers of how they're sort of you know trying to set up things that are actually going on inside of omasho here so i think it's i don't know it's something to see that there's all these different sort of you know angles that are coming together here to sort of have you no know, conflicts with our sort of own characters here right because each side is going to start thinking their own sort of you know perspective of things mm -hmm. back to jet and katara so jet explains the his backstory like what happened to him he explains that his mother was the fighter in their family she was the one who thought him to use a sword um and she was the one who fended off the fire nation um when he was attacked by the fire nation and um, so his father was the one who hid him in a well this happened when he was eight and then when he got back out of the well everyone from his village was was dead basically gone and that's how he lost everyone that's what drives him going forward um the only thing i would say about this is that i i think they probably should have shown a little bit of flashback here um just because of course we assume jet's going to come back in the next book they know he's kind of important they do have the whole rough rhino connection <laughs> from later on to add in here this kind of could have been a nice thing to add in because they have that extra layer of detail here that's not in the original of the significance of his mother being the fighter like that would have been a a cool little moment to have to really show us the impact uh on him especially if you're wanting us to be a bit sympathetic towards jet like i think you need to show some of that and um it's just an odd contrast with like they they're almost obsessed with showing us the death of katara's mother but like you, you won't show the, the other character's uh, backstory. Um, not not a huge point, but I, I, it is just something I've noticed in the many times I've uh, watched this episode now. It's like, I think Jet's significant enough to, to get a little bit of a backstory. Like, just like a 10, 20 second backstory. I think that would have, you know, just show rather than tell. That, that sort of idea. But uh, your thoughts on Jet's backstory? 
I thought that was pretty, you know, I think, you know, the fact that we're adding more depth to his character just makes him a little bit more sort of believable in sort of his actions that we eventually sort of see coming. I don't know, you know, if it's quite enough the way that we're heard to think that he's, you know, taking particularly the, the best route or the best route that he thinks he can go for it. But, you know, it's adding some sort of justifications for his actions, right? And that's, you know, a point of sort of connection with him and Qatar as we continue on here. So I think it's it's good that they're at least trying to sort of establish mm-hmm. this. I mean, yeah, like you say, next we get Katara explaining the night her mother died. Uh, she talks about how it was quiet until the soldiers came and that recently she has been thinking about it more and more and it has been affecting her bending. So Jet actually helps her through this here. He asks what she remembers about her mother, specifying, no, not how she died, just how she was, like day to day. And so Katara talks about the normal times with her mother, that um, Kaya would often um, wake up uh, pretty early, watch the sun rise, and she'd always turn back to Katara, smiling. That's a, a memory she has of nearly every day. And Jet's kind of like, focus on that as your memory of your mother, not the tragic nature in which she died. Um, and so, yeah, Katara tries to water whip again, remembering the positive moment of her mother smiling at the, the sunrise. And she actually manages to make the feelings flow, the water flow, uh, and she gets the water whip right. And uh, Jet delivers the line, um, we shouldn't be afraid of our pain. We just need to decide what to do with it. And it's obviously the idea of Katara is going to make the right choice in regards to this. Jet has made the wrong choice even though he's wise enough to maybe see some of this stuff, but he has, in the end, decided to use his pain in the wrong way overall, which is um, the kind of tragic part of of Jet as a character, of course. Um, So, yeah, this is all kind of, I think, um, pretty well done. Um, It's, it's, I think, just about the fact that they, they do then feel the need to also deliver the full backstory in like two episodes time and like we'd already touched on the backstory a little bit before this and it's like there's more to Katara than just her mother's backstory um which there's a reason it's not delivered until season three and it you you ask a few questions about like why are they overly focused on some of this stuff in terms of like my my idea here probably would more be like I, I you probably shouldn't have done the full backstory in episode five you maybe should have included some jet backstory here showing it but um it, it it works the emotional core of this really really works in terms of sai helped Sokka. here we see jet help katara that definitely like really really works as like ang helps her the early stages jet helps her here this is the very very successful part of this um overall but um what are your thoughts on um the jet katara scene you yeah, know I, I overall i really like the sort of breakdown of the feelings and sort of coming to terms with it i think you know that definitely you know it feels like one of those classic sort of avatar sort of wisdom moments right where you're sort of trying to sort of get the deeper meaning or the deeper understanding of your character or the characters in order to sort of help them sort of achieve you know what their current sort of goals are so i think that definitely worked pretty well for me and yeah it does definitely feel like sometimes they are sort of you know making that sort of a a core component of sort of Katara's character, um, which, you know, at some point it it is, you know, that is part of her sort of upbringing, something that she's always sort of dealing with, but definitely it feels like sometimes they might be pushing that a little bit too much, but I get it at this point in time, that's sort of like the the key connection point with the two characters here. So it makes sense to use it in this instance, even if it maybe might not need as much of it here. Mm Next, we have uh, Iroh and Zuko have arrived in the city. They're kind of uh, undercover here. Once again, Iroh is focused on the food (laughs) in the markets. Um, And, of course, we get the idea that Zuko doesn't really appreciate the city, whereas, like, Iroh is actually taking it all in uh, as he picks up a white lotus tile, of course. Um, So Zuko is then very shocked to hear that apparently the Fire Nation is bombing Omashu, because that's the the way people associate it as happening. Uh, He feels that his father would never allow or advocate for something like this happening. But Iroh kind of points out that, well, with the war lasting so long, no one knows where uh, 
true north lies basically in the fire nation so just this idea of the war has lasted so long and people are changing effectively and uh, things you wouldn't usually do maybe actually are happening now and um it's i think it's meant to link a little bit in again in with the, the scene with zuko from earlier on where he kind of like um uh, criticizes g for like uh speaking out against a um, higher ranked officer it's like zuko oddly focused on the you know making sure the fire nation is honorable in all things when it's not really actually been that way for quite a long time that you know when will he open his eyes and actually see the the error of the war effectively is kind of what the big thing you're waiting for with Zuko but um uh, a, a nice little scene I think Iroh and Zuko are characterized pretty well here um in terms of appreciation not non-appreciation of the city but uh, your thoughts <laughs> yeah no I mean Zuko is still very much so driven by his sort of ideals and idealistic sort of you know mentality of the fire nation that still hasn't sort of been like burnt out of him yet at this point so he still has that sort of you know hope that things you know even though you know war overall isn't good at all in any sort of fashion you know there's some or at least in his mind there's some sort of method to the madness but you know he's slowly learning that there isn't quite and of course iro is already sort of wise enough to realize this, you know, having already been with it and involved and stuff like that. So it's definitely interesting to see, you know, sort of the continual sort of contrast between the two of them and, you know, where they're sort of trying to push them going forward. So I think that, you know, that works well. I think it's keeping his character mm -hmm. going. Uh, next scene is uh, Azula writes to Commander Zhao. She wants uh, him to keep her informed of what Zuko is up to. And if he agrees, she will help him out, basically, promotions, that sort of thing. And um, a delighted Zhao, of course, receives the letter and is very, very eager to be involved in the kind of bigger picture game. Finally, someone has kind of noticed him and he's going to take advantage of this. And um, this is the aspect of the Azula arc that I actually, like, really, really like. I think this is a great change um, in that, like... This, I think, helps to make up for the fact that, like, they didn't do, like, a big scene like the Zhao, Zuko, Agni Kai. Uh, having Azula sort of almost, like, sponsor Zhao over the course of the the season, and it actually builds up to, in, like, the finale, um, a pretty good moment in terms of, like, the scenes have to be changed around a bit. So how does Azula get brought up to Zuko? Well, through Zhao, of course. And, and I think that works really, really well. So... This is the successful stuff on the Azula side of the story. The the training scenes, maybe not so much, but it's, um, you know, some good, some bad is, is, the, is the general Azula opinion from me. But uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Azula uh, wanting to work with Zhao here? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I thought for me personally, I thought it worked pretty well. I know there's definitely some sort of back and forth with people on their sort of idea of thinking, you know, maybe Zhao was too much of a, a puppet here. But I think, you know, in terms of, you know, in my mind of like what feels more sort of realistic, um, you know, this feels like something that would happen, like sort of behind the scenes sort of dealing. Now, would it necessarily be the sort of crown princess or whatever involving themselves directly in these matters? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, Azula is sort of the, the type of character that, you know, at least tries to be sort of like hands on directing different things. So, you know, that part seems kind of on point for her sort of character here. And Zhao definitely feels like he's one who's, you know, always trying, at least in this iteration of him, he's really trying to sort of like move up in the ranks. Like he's in this sort of backwater area, but he is sort of like high up in this backwater area, but he's still, you know, isn't good enough, hasn't, you know, sort of done the commander training, hasn't, you know, processed all that sort of stuff. So there's, you know, he has visions of, like, grandeur, which, you know, I guess even in the original one, you could see that he had that. But here it actually seems like he has, like, a direct path that we know of that he's going to get there. Um, so, no, I, I think for, for me, it, it definitely was cool to see how that was going to work and how they're sort of trying to sort of move things on their own mm. and and what i especially like about it is that like this is not what like ozai wants azula to do like she does all this behind ozai's back where uh, i suppose like he eventually finds out like that okay azula's helping Zhao, um but he just wants her to be better like mainly in terms of like skills and stuff like that to to, to form her into the perfect uh, tool weapon that he can use 
Uh, so the fact that she like specifically wants to have Zhao effectively like hinder Zuko at every possible turn is like um, it's a uh, it's some impressive kind of pettiness on um, Azula's part just to be like okay I'll I'll try and improve myself but I'll also drag Zuko down as much as possible it's uh, that feels kind of very very characterful. <laughs> um, next scene though. Um, Aang arrives back to Sai and Sokka, uh, wondering basically where Katara is. He tells Sokka about the blasting jelly and that, okay, this means Jet is behind the bombings. Katara then walks in and is just like, I know who's behind the bombings. And she's like, what? What do you mean? <laughs> um, uh, so it's just a, a bit of a funny scene here as just like she's way behind on the information here. Um, it's the, this immediately does transfer into, you know, arguing that actually, no, Sai is the bad guy. Um, but Sokka is like, no, it's Jet. She def- she tries to defend Jet, but of course, Aang and Sokka actually have evidence. Um, but she does argue that, like, I saw Sai with a Fire Nation spy. He is a traitor. Sokka argues with her and says, you don't know what you saw. Um, he says that she believes everything. She says that he never believes her. And he just responds by saying, grow up. She storms out to basically confront Jet over what happened. So this is everything coming together here and um you know everyone's partially kind of correct here because they know like half of the story here but katara is the one who i think really needs to like in this case like oh maybe i have trusted him too much but then Sokka, maybe has he asked enough questions about sai you know all this stuff kind of comes in so the complexities of the plot kind of uh coming together here um I appreciate what they're trying to do with the Sokka Katara stuff. I don't think it's the strongest arc. It kind of continues into the next episode as well. And they they pick up on this as well a little bit in like the, the coming episodes also. Um I think part of this is just that this is part of the Netflix version of Katara where she doesn't seem to be as confident as she is in the <laughs> original. And so like this idea of like Sokka never believes her. He always kind of goes over the top of her head on things and uh it, it it definitely i think i got i get the impression this has like irked people quite a lot that they have changed katara to just be lesser than what her kind of original version is for not the most maybe like obvious reason because sure okay she's a she's a master by the end of the book she'd be more confident going forward but i think people would have appreciated seeing a more confident sassier katara earlier on um uh, because this arc isn't the absolute strongest. There's little moments that I think are good in this, um, but I don't think you needed to alter Katara as much as you did. And I think that's been a, a relatively universal criticism I've seen, is that like Katara's characterization isn't most people's favorites um, overall. Um, lots of videos on YouTube kind of analyzing how they missed the mark on it. But um what are your thoughts here on the the kind of plots coming together and people figuring things out? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's a fun bit to see them sort of, you know, all come together in a sort of like meeting and sort of have their own sort of, you know, opinions on who is actually sort of the traitor. And like you said, sort of all being sort of like half correct technically. So I, I thought that was a, a good bit to sort of see, you know, the storylines converge, right? Like that's what we sort of have been waiting for here and you know sort of Saka sort of like in the middle here just sort of trying to sort of take in from both sides even though he wants to sort of support Sai because that's the the person who he's been working with the most right now right so he's sort of on that camp but even he still feels like a bit sort of like questioning on sort of what's sort of happening in the situation here but yeah I definitely can see this sort of idea of you know Katar maybe not being sort of as you know particularly forceful in her opinion um which you know i guess you know that's just sort of the way that they try to take her with this ca- with her character in this sort of series which i definitely can understand and can either be hit or miss for you in terms of like your your favoritism towards that character considering she was such a a standout one before um so definitely no can go either way for me sometimes mm-hmm. uh next scene um so Katara then finds the Freedom Fighters as they're making a move. Um, we also get a kind of shot of like Zuko seeing Katara walk right past him. So she ends up finding Jet, 
but he says there's no time to talk, that there's a big mission that they're just about to begin uh, because they're now planning to get rid of the mechanist. They've taken care of the spies around the mechanist, but now it's time to get rid of him. And she's, of course, stunned to find out about this, that like, wait, you're going to blow him up, like, really? Um, and as we see in the background, the Freedom Fighters swap out his case for one with a, a case full of blasting jelly. Um, and he's, of course, bringing this to the king. And we see that, uh, yes, Jet is hoping that this blast will take out the mechanist, a traitor in his mind. And the king, who he sees as being kind of, I guess, um, a corruption within the city. Um, but Katara kind of realizes that, like, this is also going to take out a lot of innocent people. That you'll take out, like, what, one traitor and a king you don't like, and then, like, tens of um, innocent people, all because you, you think this is what you have to do. Um, and Katara has a a real, real problem with this. That like, This is where she realizes that, like, Aang and Sokka were correct. You are the bad guy. Uh, but he just argues that this is the price of freedom. So she storms off. She just can't uh, agree with this whatsoever. She has to stop what's about to happen here because people are about to be blown up and uh, she, she needs to stop that. So um, a pretty effective scene immediately kind of having Katara turn turn around and realize she was wrong in this. But yeah, she has to take action. Um, this is a point where like I've also seen a lot of people argue that they've taken Jet a little bit like a little bit way too far because in the original it's the point that he goes too far by targeting the fire nation but specifically like basically innocent kind of fire nation civilians he's not actually eliminating military targets or who he actually has an issue with here it kind of feels even worse because he's actually only in in this specific instance taking out earth kingdom and I know a lot of people in the comments on my review for this episode like really, really, really did not like that they went to an extreme with the jet here and it took away some of the the nuance of the kind of jet Hama style villain where they take their vengeance too far, but you you still kind of understand uh. where they come from, whereas this maybe takes him past that point. And can we actually kind of come back from this? Well, I guess because it was stopped potentially um, uh, and, and we prevented him from doing too much. So Katara has, has effectively in my mind like really saved Jet from going too far but it's still the intent was there from Jet. Um, so I wouldn't be as maybe strict on it as some people but I, I do definitely see that it's like I, I think they should have kept the nuance from the original rather than making him a little bit too bluntly like whoa this is this is crazy here wanting to like kill it earth king basically here in boomy um but uh yeah wh wh what are your thoughts on uh this scene here big katara scene hmm. yeah no that's that's something to consider is this really sort of pushing jet too far sort of like over the edge in terms of the the lengths that he's willing to go to see what he thinks is sort of like a a correction of the current state of affairs and I don't know. I mean, you know, innocent life is sort of still innocent life, regardless of who else is sort of getting caught in the crossfire. So I don't know. That feels like that's sort of like, to me at least, it feels like that's sort of like on par with sort of like, you know, the edge that they're trying to go with this sort of series and this live action iteration of it. So I don't know. For me, I don't know if it bothers me as much. Does it sort of lower the idea of the nuance of his sort of character? I guess it, it does a bit. I definitely can see where that's coming from, but I think it's still, you know, the extreme left there is still, you know, just as extreme from from what I'm seeing here. And, you know, will he be redeemable regardless of either or situation is still yet to be seen in terms of how he really sort of feels on the situation. But, you know, the lefts are still sort of there. But yeah, I mean, no, so Qatar still can't sort of abide by this and it's gonna sort of go through you know the lens to sort of stop this just as we've seen sort of before here so i don't know i think you know i think that the end result still sort of works for me even if it might be maybe a bit sort of harsher than we might have expected them mm -hmm. um next we see zuko confront ang Sokka, and katara um 
uh, Aang basically decides, okay, I- I'll deal with Zuko here. Sokka and Katara are going to go deal with what's happening, basically, with Sai and Jet and everyone. Um, Iroh advises Zuko to avoid using firebending because, of course, they're in the middle of a like a stronghold here. Like you will be the enemy, but for everyone, if you firebend. So we basically have a mostly kind of like non-bending fight scene here. Aang does bits and pieces of air bending, but it's a uh, primarily a martial arts kind of chase sequence here through the markets of Omashu. Um and it, it it's quite extended as well. Like it's it's good. The choreography is good, but um part of me in the back of my head the whole time through with this scene is like I know you've explained why you can't have bending, but I also kind of feel like is this budget reasons? Like is this why this is happening? Uh, cuz you don't want to have like CG for all this fire bending. The the reason is good for why it is this way but um I, I find it difficult to maybe not be just a little bit uh skeptical about some of this stuff and and i do kind of tend to go this way a few times in the, in the series in terms of like in the middle of a fight scene let's have a a martial arts sequence instead of it being all bending um but it, it, it is it is pretty some nice choreography here overall um as as we have this uh you know, fight between like the two main characters it's, it's pretty good um but uh yeah what are your thoughts on the the ang zuko fight that happens hmm. yeah no that is that definitely is something to consider i don't i don't think for me in this one the whole idea that zuko wasn't using firebending was as much of a a budgetary constraint as it was in some of the other ones where it's like you know everyone already knows everything so it's like why aren't you just you know going all out with sort of things here um so I don't know. For me, that one didn't bother me as much on this one. But overall, I think it was a cool way to sort of see them sort of interact. And, you no, know, Zuko has always been rather good with martial arts, regardless of the situation. So the idea that he might try to sort of use that in the beginning, you no, know, doesn't really bother me too much. And he does a pretty good job of it here. Like the like you said, the choreo is pretty good. And, you know, he definitely gets the one up a couple of times on Aang here, despite, you know, sort of not using any of his sort of bending the sort of enhanced sort of his moves, at least as far as we can tell from the outskirts here. So, you no, know, I think this definitely shows sort of, you know, the sort of level of ability between our sort of two characters here, um, at least sort of at the sort of base level here. So, no, I thought that was uh, pretty good overall mm-hmm. for me. Uh, so we see Katara and Sokka are taking the delivery system up to the palace, so they have a bit of a kind of adventure ride up the, the chutes. Um the Aang and Zuko fight continues. They eventually get to talking with the the big reveal here being that Zuko figures out that Aang has his notebook and this angers him so much that he does start to firebend and um, he obviously sets some of the marketplace on fire here. This effectively ends the fight because Zuko just draws everyone's attention to what's happening here. Uh, of course, the guards get called and all this stuff is happening here. Uh, there's a lot of kind of quick kind of cuts kind of happening at this point but um some of the bigger stuff is just about to happen here um yeah the, the delivery system thing um is uh, uh relatively cool i was wondering hmm, are we actually going to get to use it here and we, we do we do um <laughs> I, I i do think it just kind of highlights the, the the kind of plot point in the the next episode that i don't kind of really like of like Ooh, we have to find a way into the palace and they just did it here uh, i get why they can't do the same thing in the following episode but i really don't like the use of cave of two lovers in the next episode so um this scene where they so quickly get to the palace kind of annoys me when i see it come up um but i do like this the almost the, the funny aspect of zuko being like you know like he's he's relatively calm fighting ang but it's like you stole my notebook. That's that's what puts him 100% over the edge. The the new live action edition where like Zuko is a uh, is a big uh, journal person. Um, it's a it's just a funny plot point. But um, what are your what are your thoughts on uh, some of these? Yeah, no, I guess you know he's sort of a, a avatar scholar here, and all of his notes are there. And you no, know, they've they've made references to it enough. You know, for the the last two episodes here that we can see that it has like some extra level of importance to Zuko, even if, you know, he probably knows everything that he's written in the book by now, like, by heart anyway. Um, but, you yeah, know, that that is sort of a funny bit here, and to get to see them have more back-and-forth here interaction and to actually get to see sort of the, the shoot system going up in the direction here and how that's sort of, you know, 
I don't know. I like that we're actually able to get to see it used in this sort of way here, um, you know, earlier on rather than just sort of like a, the end result and being actually serving like a a main sort of purpose here rather than just sort of for funds before. Mm -hmm. uh, then we get the kind of big uh, kind of set piece scene, which is that uh, at the big meeting of the king, we see Boomy for the first time and we see um, Sai arriving, Teo's there. Uh, we see Longshot is in position with a fire arrow about to kind of set the blasting jelly off. This is where Katara saves the day with uh, a water whip. So she water whips from distance and basically whips the water into the path of the arrow. So the arrow still hits the, um, the box of blasting jelly, but it goes out. It's not a fire arrow anymore because it has to go through the water whip. Um, this is the shot that they explained in interviews was the most complicated bending shot in the entire show. Um, just because of like the, I guess the physics of effectively of the situation here, the speed of the arrow, speed of a water whip and all this sort of stuff. Um, and so yeah, Katara does save Boomy from being blown up here, Sai from being blown up. This ruins Jet's plan here. It is a very cool um, sequence here overall of like Katara kind of realizing she's wrong, but now saving the day. So uh, nice uh, scene overall here. But yeah, what are your thoughts on the most complex uh, shot in the show? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean. I don't know. For anyone who's worked with like fluid dynamics and simulations and stuff, they're they're always kind of a pain to work with. So I can understand why that was a, a pretty complicated shot, especially when it actually has to interact with the fire itself. So the fact that that might have been a one of the most or the most you know complicated shot in the scenes kind of makes sense to me personally. Um, but you no, know, in terms of how they're doing it for the scene here, definitely, you know, it's pretty cool. I like how you know they sort of you know slow down the time to show the importance to it of everything, and so it's just a sort of a just their take on how you know sort of it would have happened in sort of the from the original sort of cartoon here. I think the only way it could have been cool is if it was just sort of like a an ice block instead of just sort of a, a water whip or anything like that. But Qatar doesn't quite know those sort of abilities quite yet here, so I think it works for what they're sort of trying to mm -hmm. do here. Um, in the next scene, it's uh, Aang putting out the fire in the market as panic basically takes over the marketplace. Uh, the guards are, of course, after a firebender. They, clearly, firebending was seen. Um, Iroh realizes he needs to get Zuko out, so he basically gives himself up. He gives them their firebender. He uh, firebends into the air, letting them know it's him, lets himself get caught. And this allows Zuko to go uh, out undercover, you know, through the front gate um, in the panic, basically. So he manages to get free, but Iroh has been captured to make this happen. And then uh, the last shot is that we also see Aang is arrested, I guess, for being involved in a fight scene uh, throughout the city as well. So um, <laughs> this sets up the idea of, oh, well, Iroh and Aang going to prison together. That's a, an interesting kind of plot point. And the big real setup here is that we saw Boomy just a second ago. The next episode is going to be more Boomy focused. So it's basically, yeah, Aang is going to meet the king. Um, but that is how we end it here. Our kind of first proper, you would say, like cliffhanger ahead of another episode. Because they're doing a two-parter for Omashu here. Oh. So, um interesting stuff here because this obviously sets up the um from the original it's like the 107 uh iro zuko earthbenders kind of plot uh, and then it's ang more directly with the kind of 105 plot so um you know you can see what they're kind of trying to do here as they transition from more original content into like uh adaptation stuff for the next episode but uh what are your thoughts on the final couple of yeah i mean i think this was a uh a good way to sort of do their sort of cliffy for everything that they've set up before just sort of getting at the idea that there's you know more coming here we have characters that are sort of like captured and that's always going to be like an interesting one to sort of see how they sort of react to the situation that they currently find themselves in especially since you know of course you know ang doesn't see why he would be captured at all right so he's like completely sort of confused at the end of things which i think they do a pretty good job of you know him sort of displaying that at the end of the episode and you know zuko sort of being on his sort of own a little bit you know maybe not fully alone but he's definitely sort of in a situation where he has to sort of think on his own and figure out things mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that is um, 
the Omashi, the first part of this arc. Um, like I said, 104 Into the Dark is like direct sequel to this, of course, heavily kind of interlinks into this. Um, what is so interesting to me is that 103 to me comes across as just overall like very, very solid within the season. It's it's not one of the absolute best episodes, but I don't think it's one of the weakest ones. Um, I think it is a bit unfortunate that this episode ends up being let down, in my opinion, by 104, which, from what I've seen online, is probably, for most people, the, the universally least liked episode. Seems like it's either 4 or 5 is what people go for as being the weakest one. Um, it does, to me, just get a little bit messy. Um, I think a lot of people have issue with the characterization of Boomy in the next one. You probably have, I think, the weirdest adaptation choice in the entire show with um, Cave of Two Lovers. And then just um, the the general and I think kind of weird plot point of, like, effectively, like, Jet, Teo, the Mechanist are all more or less, like, dropped as characters pretty early on. Like, there's one Jet scene, the Mechanist is in a scene at the very start and very end... And like Teo's like barely there. It's a, it's a odd uh, switch up, given that it's effectively like a two parter. Uh, there's a there's a complete kind of contrast here going into it. But um, uh, I suppose just as a bit of a kind of preview kind of thing. Like um, how how do you think the 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 second part of this kind of works, given that like I think we're both pretty positive on this first part of it. Yeah, yeah, it definitely. It definitely slants the episode towards the unfavorable um, when you're sort of considering the next episode. And I don't, I don't think I think of it quite as bad as other people, but I definitely see the merits in some of the characters sort of not particularly being, you know, sort of on par of what we sort of, you know, already think is sort of established with them. And even trying to think of them sort of in isolation to, you know, the best of my ability still find some things a bit sort of, you know, off-putting which maybe that's intended maybe that's not intended you know can get more into that when we never recover the next one but i think it is something to sort of consider in terms of like you know what characters still get play and which ones sort of get pushed to the side which is you know sort of unfortunate considering you know how integral they were before mm. and it is so weird because like i would actually say like i think the the best scene in the whole live action season one is in the next episode but i probably would consider it to be the worst episode so um it, it, it's 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 a, it's an unusual show in terms of like there's there's kind of weird kind of inconsistencies but uh, i suppose just as a final point like wh which episode would, would you actually consider to be the kind of like uh weakest and, and i guess strongest um given that you've, you've seen it all hmm. i don't know i think most of the time for the weakest ones i don't want to say seven but usually i switch between four or five i think seven there's some aspects of it that i just don't quite like as much even though i like that we're finally getting into the end of things and then in terms of strongest i mean i don't know i kind of like six and eight for the most part and then maybe one of the earlier mm -hmm. ones in terms of my personal favorite but I don't think I've done as much sort of trying to break it down as I might have liked to in order to do that as much. Plus, I would like to see you know, more episodes from the rest of the show whenever we get to that, of course. But mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's it very much in line with what a lot of people think. Um, uh, I, I, I do think like there's probably a lot of um, I hate dislike for episode five, whereas I think I have a bit of a soft spot for episode five just because it's got spirit world stuff and I like that. But there is some messy stuff there. Um, <laughs> six seems to be kind of a universally quite liked one, very much along the lines of, of the first episode as well. Um, but yeah, I, I'd definitely be in agreement that episode seven is actually one of the ones where I, I don't think people are talking about it as much as being one of the weaker ones. But um, it, it's weird because that one is like, it's an episode adapting just one episode. I mean, and even though it's one of the shorter episodes, it still has more than enough time to do 118. But then it doesn't even do all of 118 um, because of how they do like Paku as a character. It's um, it's an unusual one where the show at times can be like lightning paced, but then there are other times when it just doesn't cover ground as much as it needs to. Um, so it's 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 an un unusual kind of uh, show in that way. Um, which I suppose speaks to the kind of overall kind of reaction of just like, 
it's it's decent there's there's pros and cons to it um but uh it's it's interesting and it, and at least there's discussions happening versus like the the last airbender movie where it, you, you can't really discuss it online without it just becoming a who can make the funniest kind of criticism of the show type discussion uh this at least like it like, like we like we talked about it's on a scene to scene basis it's broadly pretty solid um and i think that's the what we needed uh, at the very least but um uh yeah i suppose i suppose you do just have any fi- final thoughts for this um episode on the live action given that it's our first time i suppose talking about the whole show to a certain degree yeah no i mean i think you know this one does a good job at least sort of trying to integrate in combination of different elements which i think is something that the show overall you know tries to do to some regard and you know with you no. Know, Within you know some confines, it does you know pretty successful. I think there there definitely are some areas where you know there's elements of maybe I don't know necessarily pacing, but just where you know things could have been spread out or sort of you know given room to sort of breathe a bit. But I think for the most part, it it works in terms of like streamlining streamlining a lot of different ideas together. Yeah, the 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 kind of breathing room point is like the the my big one I think with this show is that like if it just had an episode two episodes mm. more we just had more of an opportunity for the characters to just like hey it's it's katara having more of a fun arc while the other characters have more serious stuff going on because like i think we we missed out on elements of that of like katara in the fortune teller like Sokka in the fortune teller th- those type of moments where you it's not maybe character development but it's just learning more about the characters whereas we're, we're so focused on this is the arc for the character that we kind of forget that oh yeah ang is interesting in other ways apart from responsibility responsibility like um do your duty as the avatar um like some of those fun <laughs> moments for him are kind of just as interesting in, in a way as well and um, so it'll be interesting to see how they go about doing like book two and three and stuff like that and um when it, it does seem like one of the big things they probably need is just like yeah they need to get another episode in there somewhere because uh, it's going to be very tricky to do all more detailed plots of the book two and three in, in this many episodes. Um, but um, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll be back on the uh, the next podcast with our review for uh, Into the Dark and of course continuing onward remaining episodes as well. But uh, for now, that has been episode uh, 271 of the Avatar Online podcast. It's been myself and Greg. Thanks for listening and bye. Bye-bye.